This is technically my mother's story, although I'm also in it. So when I was four months old in 1994, my mum and dad had been having some money issues and as a result, we would often work late. One late Wednesday night, around 9pm, there was a knock on the door and my mum put me down in the living room and went to see if it was dad, having forgotten his keys. She opened the door without looking properly and a man was standing on the doorstep. He smiled at her and asked if he could use our phone as his car had broken down. Flustered, she said yes and walked backwards a little to let him get the telephone that lived on the hall table. However, he didn't stop at the table and he kept walking up the hall towards her. She asked him what he wanted, pointing at the phone saying it was right there and said that her husband was getting out of the shower. And this is where it starts getting really creepy. So he stopped walking, cocked his head to one side, said that he didn't hear the shower running and then gave her a really big smile. He added that he thought it was just her home right now wasn't it? Mum said at this point that all she could think about was trying to make it to me, maybe dropping me out of the window, trying to get us into the bathroom that had a lock in it, praying to any god or gods that were listening that dad would pull up in the driveway, just anything. And then she heard a growl. Mum had been out getting the washing in from the outside laundry before she'd gone in to check on me in the living room and had left the back door open a crack. And our Doberman pride had gotten in the house and had walked out of the kitchen into the hallway between mum and this man. She started growling and showing all her teeth and mum told him to get out now before she set the dog on him. Apparently, he freaked out and backed out of the house before taking off down the street. Dad got home about 20 minutes later. Felt like an eternity according to mum. The man was never caught and we never saw him again. And I really hope that I never do even though I wouldn't know him if I saw him. Pride lived till she was 13 and was the most spoiled dog ever after that. I really don't know what would have happened to mum or me without her. My parents and I used to go to an old fancy restaurant by the docks and while it's still there to this day, we haven't had the chance to go back. I've been going to the same restaurant for as long as I can remember really and I love the food. However, I don't remember this encounter but maybe that's a good thing too. So in 2003, my parents decided to take me to the restaurant for the first time and have a nice evening meal. My dad and mum ordered their usual and she ordered me something off the kids menu. I ended up eating my mother's food because of how much I liked it but my mother's a sweet woman so she didn't mind. Just as we were finishing our meal though, an older woman waltzed up to the table and said, You know, when I saw you two walk in with your baby, I thought, Oh no, it's going to ruin my dinner. But your baby is so well behaved and pretty too. I would love to have your baby. My mum laughed it off as a joke and thanked the woman for her kind compliments. The woman walked back to her table and sat down next to an older man, probably a husband or something. But my mum said that whenever she looked at the couple, they had their eyes just locked onto me. She did her best to just ignore it, but as we were about to leave, the woman walked back to the table and said, I would really like to have your baby. My mum got really creeped out and tried her best to keep her composure. And she said, she's not for sale, sorry. And the woman just said, but she's so pretty, I would like to have her. My mum told the crazy lady that she couldn't take me away from her parents. The woman scoffed and walked towards the exit with her husband or whoever he was, standing next to the door, lying us down. My dad didn't do anything for some reason, probably because he knows that he's big enough to do some damage if the woman tried anything. I'm glad that I don't remember this, but it's a creepy story nonetheless. This happened about a year ago. So I was on Grindr looking for either fun dates or new friendships, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Grindr, it's a social media app that is designed primarily for gay men and many people use it to hook up with other men. So one day I was scrolling and I received a new message from a guy who we'll call Brian. I took a look at some of his profile pictures, read his bio and decided that I was interested in him. We started messaging back and forth and he seemed to be really kind, a charismatic guy who really knew how to hold a conversation, something that is very hard to come by on that app. A few days went by and we eventually exchanged numbers and he seemed nice enough. 
and I wanted to see if he was as great in person as he was over text message. So I asked him if he wanted to go on a date with me, and he very happily agreed. So I scheduled a date with him, and the plan was that I was going to drive to his place and pick him up, and we'd grab some lattes at my favorite local coffee shop, and it was around 6 p.m. I sent him a text message to tell him that I was leaving my house, to which he responded with a quaint, I can't wait to meet you. I smiled at his supposed kindness, and then in the middle of driving to his house, I received a phone call from him, so I picked up, and the conversation went mostly as follows. Hey Brian, what's up? Hey, uh, a quick change of plans. I'm sorry to do this, but I'm feeling tired, and I'd rather not go out. Would you be okay with just staying at my place? We can watch some shows and order some takeout. I mean, uh, that's not what I really had in mind. I really like to go out and do things on the first date. Uh, don't be such a buzzkill. Just come over. I won't show you a bad time, trust me. As he spoke on the phone, I just got a really strange feeling in my gut. Like something was wrong about how he talked to me. Before I met him, I imagined his voice and inflections to sound a lot more light-hearted because of the way that he texted was very whimsical and fun. But over the phone, he talked as if he was kind of in a bit of a hurry, perhaps slightly frantic. However, despite my gut feeling, I decided that I should accept his offer. Maybe he was just tired or stressed or nervous from the workday or something. I pulled into his driveway and he greeted me at his door. He looked like his picture and he was very handsome. He was wearing fashionable glasses, and his dark, straight hair contrasted with his light skin. When we go inside, I was greeted by one of his roommates who was playing Dark Souls in the living room. I wanted to be polite, so I approached the roommate and introduced myself. I didn't want to come off as rude to Brian in case this date ended up going really well. But while I'm talking with his roommate, Brian calls my name and beckons me to walk inside his bedroom. I politely excused myself and followed Brian into his room. Now, when I walked inside, I saw something straight out of a fucking no-sleep story. Only this was real and right in front of me. There were candles just lit everywhere, and when I got a closer look, I noticed that there were several altars scattered across the room. Effigies of ancient-looking figures, animal bones, jars with unidentifiable liquids inside, some sort of dagger next to a cat skull, I think. The whole shebang. I don't remember all the altars, but I do remember a couple, and one of them was on the floor, and there was a glass container that held some kind of yellow liquid with animal skulls surrounding the container. Another altar was on a shelf next to his bed, and this one had a few candles surrounding some kind of doll with its eyes sewn shut and its hands missing. Now, that one was creepy and super bizarre, I admit. A part of me was telling me to nope the hell out of there immediately, but... I thought that maybe I was just overreacting to somebody else's religious choices. I didn't know much about cult religion, so I didn't want to assume that this guy had any kind of malintent. Plus, I could be a little reactive at times, so I decided to stay and go along with the ride. When we walked into his room, I wanted to calm my nerves, and because I have a really curious mind, I decided to ask Brian about what these altars were for. He told me that he'd tell me about them later, which was a weird response, but again, I just kind of brushed it off my shoulders thinking that he might just be a bit eccentric. I can be a little weird too, after all, so I just tried to be empathetic and understanding. Then I point to one of the altars and asked about it. He frowns at me then and scowls, don't touch that. His voice startled me too. His intense inflections paired with his angry expression sent a lump straight to my throat. And, quite honestly, I felt threatened. I was almost four feet away from the altar, not even close to touching it, and yet he just yelled at me like a father yelling at his kid to stop messing around at church. I was confused and thinking that I'd done something wrong, so I apologized. And in the blink of an eye, his scowl turned into a smile and he kindly invited me to sit with him to watch a show. But what really weirded me out was the fact that his smile looked and felt genuine. He had just gotten angry, but all of a sudden he just didn't care and served me up a really kind disposition. But I was unsure of how to process what had just happened, so I decided to just sit down with him, and he seemed to be acting pretty normal once this ordeal had happened. So we just started to talk about ourselves, and after some time he became really sweet and soft-spoken. 
similar to how he was over text messages, and we were able to share some stories about our lives and whatnot. It was starting to feel like an actual first date, and my nerves subsided a bit. I was probably just overthinking everything else. But then he turns on the TV, and mind you, I was still a little freaked out by his random outburst, so I was still on guard. So I offered to invite his roommate to come and hang out with us. Brian's roommate seemed like a, an old average Joe kind of guy when I met him, and I just wanted someone else to be there to act as a bit of a buffer. I wanted to see how he would act around other people, but when I gave him my idea, he just immediately shut me down, and his personality switched from easygoing to stressed and kind of angry. He started cussing out his roommate to me, making it clear that he absolutely hated him. The switch was just so jarring too that I actually started to panic again. Then he changed the subject and started to talk about me. He said that he found me really attractive and in the process, his fingers started to graze my thighs. I needed a second to collect myself though, so I excused myself to get some water. When I stood up, he immediately slapped my ass and told me to not take too long. I walked out, closed the door behind me and started to make my way for the kitchen. I was hoping to chat with his roommate on the way and see if I could ask him about Brian, but he was asleep on the living room couch, so I just made a beeline to the cabinets in search of a cup. I thought about walking out at that point and just driving home because I didn't appreciate his sudden touchiness, but I started to get paranoid. I mean, he had all those altars and he didn't really tell me what the altars were for. I've seen some horror films about the occult and I truly had no idea what this guy was capable of. Yeah, he was sweet at times, I admit, but he was showing me some really aggressive behavior too. Who's to say that this guy isn't able to put some kind of voodoo curse on me or something? Dramatic, I know, but you can never really be too sure, right? So I grab my water and I cautiously head back to his room. Now, when I walked back inside, I saw him sitting on the couch with his legs crisscrossed and his eyes closed. When I approached him, I saw his mouth moving, but... I didn't hear anything coming out from it. Weirded out by this, I called his name, but he didn't respond. That was weird. So I called his name a second time, and he opened his eyes, uncrossed his legs, and went back to watching TV without at all addressing what he was doing. And I mean, what the hell, right? I was getting really worried at this point. I did what I could to keep my cool, I didn't want to do anything to upset him or make him lose his cool. So I sat next to him on the couch and we start talking. Once again, he was completely normal. Unnervingly normal, actually. It's like I was in the room with a real-life Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, except Brian was able to switch between them seamlessly. I needed to do something, but what the hell was I supposed to do? I couldn't call him out because he might lash out in some malicious way, but I didn't want to stay because he was freaking me the hell out. In the end, I just stay and try to devise some kind of plan to just get out of there without making him angry. At some point, he gets up to grab his phone, and I thought I would try dishing out the same kind of ass grab that he gave me when I went to get some water. Maybe it would release the tension that I was feeling. Maybe he'd like it, and I'd make him less aggressive. Regardless, I wanted to try something. I made my move and gave him a cheeky ass grab, and immediately... He turned around and swatted my hand away and lunged at me. He had his hand curled up in a fist and he flung it towards my face. His fist was inches away from making connection with my right cheek, but he stopped mid-punch. In that moment, I saw that his eyes were wide open and his facial expression was cold and emotionless. He was right in my face. My heart was beating so fast that I felt like I was seconds away from an aneurysm. He was looking directly at me and my eyes stared back. And at that moment... I felt like prey to a predator. Then he uncurled his fist, put his icy hands on both sides of my face and started to squeeze. He said to me, you're just so cute. He pulled me in and forced a kiss and I did absolutely not want to kiss him. But I was paralyzed and couldn't will myself to push him away. His words were patronizing, sort of like he was talking to a dog as well, and it felt even more like this because he had just scrunched my face against his. I felt disgusting kissing someone who had almost punched me in the face, but there was nothing I could do in that moment. Again, I didn't want to risk pissing him off and escalating the situation. 
He slowly pulled away, gave me another sweet smile and sat down, pretending like nothing had just happened. Just started staring at the TV again. And at this point, yes, I'm definitely over this, completely. His behavior was becoming more erratic and more unpredictable every moment. His room was creepy as shit. He clearly had associations with the occult and frankly, he was scaring me. I eventually decided that I'd rather deal with the voodoo looking altars later on than stay in this house and have to put up with the immediate danger. So I snapped myself out of my anxiety induced trance, stood up and told him that I was starting to get sick and that I wanted to go home. He got angry and tried to convince me to stay the night, but I gathered my courage and insisted that it was time for me to leave. He begrudgingly let me, but it was clear that my decision pissed him off. Honestly, though, I didn't really care anymore. I said my goodbyes and told him that I'd text him later, thinking hell no to myself while doing so. I got in my car and drove home shaking and sweating. I felt relieved to get out of there, but nervous that he might try to do something in the end. The uncertainty of it all was what truly shaked me up, but thankfully, no actual harm came to me. But who knows what would have happened if I had actually stayed, though. After that, I blocked Brian's number as well as his grinder profile, and even now, I keep my own grinder pictures private. I haven't heard from him since, but I still fear that he's going to try and come after me, somehow. My experience happened about two months ago. A friend of my girlfriend asked us to watch her in her husband's house for two days while they were away for a wedding, mainly to feed their two cats, etc. The thing is, though, is that their house had a gruesome murder happen there a few years prior. The husband was killed with a blunt object in the garage, and his wife's throat was cut in the main bedroom by a former employee of them. And both of us knowing what happened in that house, we were already pretty freaked out by it. So the first night, me and my girlfriend had an argument and she decided to sleep on the couch in the living room. Now, the position she was laying in, she could see into a small room that leads to a bathroom, but at the entrance of the room there was a PC desk with a chair and whatnot. I was getting ready to sleep on the other couch, sleeper couch, when I noticed she suddenly jolted up without saying a word and wanted to switch couches. Upon switching couches, she eventually fell asleep and I was lying awake when... I heard clicking noises in the storage room that you have to enter through the kitchen. It was an open plan house, so the living room directly led into the kitchen. I noticed the clicking noises and immediately got freaked out and went to go sleep next to my girlfriend eventually. The next morning, I told her what I heard and she said the reason she jolted up like that was because she saw someone sitting in the PC chair, but she immediately said that she may have just imagined it. That evening, we decided to sleep in the guest room no way I was sleeping in the main room where the woman was killed. Eventually, we settled in ready to sleep when I asked her if I should activate the alarm, but she said no because she might have to go and pee at some point in the night. At around 2am, we both woke up from one cat meowing, but it kind of sounded more like a cry and it just wasn't normal. The cat meowed consistently, but each meow lasted like 10 seconds as if it was trying to get our attention. I told my girlfriend to stay in the room and as I was standing in front of the closed guest room door, I thought to myself that someone was going to be in the house, given its history with the murder and whatnot. So I opened the door quickly, living room clear, and as I turned left into the living room and started walking towards the kitchen, I saw the one cat looking really frightened behind a cupboard towards the storage room. As soon as I got next to the cat, I heard something move and bang really loudly in the storage room. I immediately yelled for my girlfriend to get the cell phone ready while I grabbed a folding knife that was lying on the kitchen table. I walked slowly towards the storage room, scared shitless but ready to face whoever was in there. I took a deep breath and entered the room quickly but to my surprise, nothing was there. The windows were closed so it couldn't have been a wild animal or anything. The second cat seemed relaxed while the other one was definitely tensed up. It couldn't have been another cat or anything. Note too that this is the same room that I heard the clicking noises the night prior. Needless to say though, I was very happy that that was our last night in there. My 
My dad's job requires him to go inside people's houses. He's been in thousands of apartments and houses, so I asked him what was the creepiest or weirdest thing that he ever saw or experienced. And this is what he told me. So my dad arrived early at this apartment complex around 7am because he had to go through every apartment, doing some maintenance starting from the basement. He entered a laundry room located in the basement where there was a man, around 50-ish, wearing a nice white t-shirt with a tie, suits and pants, but had no shoes and he had a green tarp in his hands. He thought it was kind of weird, but just ignored it since it was not his business. Later that day, he left to go to a local coffee shop to spend his break and when he came back to work, there were police cars surrounding the area just everywhere. Out of curiosity, he asked one of the police officers what was going on and it turns out that a homicide was committed. Dad then asked if what he saw was related to this crime and boy, was it ever. So after the police interrogation, they told him that the man without shoes stabbed his mother to death in his bathtub, wrapped her in a tarp and dragged her outside. The police allegedly caught this guy dragging his dead mother in the backyard. Of course, they didn't let my dad do his job in the murderer's apartment until after a proper investigation. A while goes by though and my dad gets to go back in there to finish whatever he was doing. And he said that he just felt really uncomfortable doing plumbing and other maintenance in a house where someone got brutally murdered. Especially in a bathroom where the bathtub was still full of dried up blood. So I've lived in my townhouse now for over two years and I could tell right away that the vibe was off when I first moved in. And things were really bad for a while but now they've just gotten so much worse. So I have a stair that I call the murder stair because I constantly trip or get hurt on this one stair. This is the same stair that I'll see a face watching me from while I'm in the living room. I constantly see someone on the stairs from the corner of my eye while I'm in my living room too. The main thing on the stairs is a face that looks like a young boy watching me quite often. It looks like it's just peering around the corner and watches me when I'm alone. I'm not sure how to describe the face but it's really grey with black tones, black eyes and really funky teeth. I don't feel threatened when it's watching but more like it's just keeping an eye on me if that makes sense. So my son has come to me and asked me if I was watching him brush his teeth because he saw someone behind him when he was brushing. Or he's told me about the scary person that he sees in his room sometimes. Now, I haven't talked to him about what I've seen at all, so I know that he's not lying to me either. I've also had maintenance men freak out while doing work in my place, but there was an older guy doing work in my kitchen while I was there talking with him, and he whipped around behind me and asked if somebody else was here because he saw someone walk up next to him. I can usually tell if it's in my living room too because it will mess with the blinds on my curtains. It also will sometimes throw water bottles or Febreze bottles off of the countertops or dresses. It calmed down a bit when I got my therapy dog but now she'll just randomly stop and watch the stairs, especially at night. And she won't step on the stairs if it's dark or if I'm not with her. She watches certain areas too that I usually see the face and she does not like being left on the stairs alone but she also will randomly start and then run upstairs like she's just running from something. Anyway, today I'm going to try my rosary beads to hang on the stairs where the spot that I see the face most is, and I'm going to try again today to take my phone and set it up to record it just to see if anything happens. Mainly because it's actually not limited to night time, but it also occurs in the day. I haven't spoken to my son about anything yet. He's on a road trip with my parents and won't be back until Saturday, but... Wish me luck guys and if I see anything or find anything on my phone, I'll be sure to show you guys. I live in Adelaide in South Australia. I moved to the city from a small country town with my partner, Mrs. Bradjikarp, roughly 10 years ago now. But we moved into a small two-story townhouse with another friend. It was a really nice place too. Clearly an older building, but the interior had been modernized. So everything started off okay. Our friends took the master bedroom, which came with a walk-in robe while we took the room next door. Both bedrooms and bathroom were on the second floor. 
Under the stairs was a small broom cupboard. We didn't use it much at first because for some reason it was extremely cold in there. But nothing could heat it up either, not even a heater which was weird. We assumed that there was a hole leading to the outside somewhere or something and we just left it at that. It was about a month into living there though that the first weird thing occurred. So I was home alone sitting downstairs with the TV on quietly while I read a book and I heard my name. I looked at the TV, thinking that someone on there must have also been named Bradgicarp. But no, nobody on the episode of Scrubs was named that. Out of sheer curiosity, though, I turned the TV off and listened intently. And there was nothing. So I figured it must have been my imagination and went to turn the TV back on. As I pressed the power button, I heard my name again, though, and the voice was definitely coming from upstairs. I've believed in the paranormal since I was a kid, due to other experiences, but this, for some reason, just really got my hairs on end. I called Mrs. B and asked when she would come home, and not until tomorrow, I'm staying at my mum's overnight, she said. Our other housemate was also away. Great, so I just turned the TV back on and raised the volume, found some blankets in the cold cupboard, and slept downstairs that night. The name calling continued on and off for a few months, but our other housemates never heard it. In fact, she didn't believe in any paranormal things and thought I was just making it up. Mrs. B did though and agreed that there was something else in the house, because not long after, our housemate moved out and we took over the master bedroom. A few days later, a handyman came to install the TV antenna plugged on the wall downstairs. To get wires through the walls, we had to get into the crawl space upstairs. It was around lunchtime and we had an awesome takeaway place around the corner. I let the guy know that I was ducking out for 10 minutes or so to grab some food and left him in the crawl space. And when I got back, I found him downstairs looking really confused. Hey, uh, did you come back about 5 minutes ago and call my name? He asked. I said no. And he explained that he heard the door open and close and that his name was called. He chalked it up to the next door neighbor, but... I knew that it wasn't. The real terror though began about a week after that. So I came home from work at around 8pm. Mrs. B was working late and wouldn't be home until midnight. But when I walked into the back door, I directly heard her call my name from upstairs. I called back that I didn't think she'd be home yet and made my way upstairs, opening the bedroom door. I instantly realized that it was not Mrs. B who called me. A wave of hate just burst from that door and hit me like a ton of bricks and never before and never again have I ever felt a presence like that. But whatever the hell it was did not like me at all. I quickly got changed and I took a look around the room. The walk-in robe had a white curtain for a door and I closed it every morning when we left the house and it was wide open. I raced downstairs and left the house and I just went to the pub that day. I met Mrs. B at home when she finished and told her what happened. She didn't believe me at first, but when she saw how terrified I was of our room, she realized then that I wasn't lying or trying to pull the wool over her eyes. The hate in the room was gone at this point, but I could still feel something. We went to bed though, and I closed the robe curtain again. I swear that I could feel eyes on me as I did so though, and I slept on the side of the bed furthest away from it. And in the morning, you probably guessed it, but that curtain was wide open again. We lived in that house for a couple of months after that, and I never experienced the hate as intense as that again until our final day in the house. But there was definitely still something there, something that didn't want me there too. I put all my clothes in the spare room so I didn't have to go on the walk-in ever again because that's where whatever it was felt strongest to me. It was also the location of the crawlspace hatch. Friends heard the voices call out sometimes, but nobody else felt the presence like I did. And the day we moved out, I was the last one there, and as I was checking over all the rooms and locks for the last time, I heard my name again. I shivered, but this time I ignored it and kept doing what I was doing. I checked the last lock and walked out of the house for the last time. I got in my car and looked up at the master bedroom window and I swear to you that without a doubt there was a woman up there glaring at me. That feeling of just pure hatred hit me for the last time and I floored it out of that street and never looked back. 
Mrs. B to this day doesn't believe me about that because she didn't see it with her own eyes. I can appreciate the need to see to believe, but I know what I saw and I really hope that I never see it again. From what I've heard, the tenants after us didn't stay long either. I did some research but couldn't find any deaths in that home, so I'm not too sure where whatever it is came from. All I know is that it was absolutely real and, quite honestly, scared the hell out of me. A few years ago, my boyfriend and best friend of four years had just dumped me. I was using this website, Meet Me, to meet people in my area while I was in college. My profile clearly stated that I was not explicitly looking for anyone to date, just wanted to meet new people. I had just been dumb, so I was really just trying to put myself out there, and I'm not really the type to go out. In my area, there's a giant dance-a-thon that my university did every year to raise money for a children's hospital. I had someone message me and ask if I had heard of it. I told him that my dance team usually performed at it every year. He told me that he was actually one of the children that was supported by the event when he was younger. I thought that that was really cool, so I asked him a little bit about his experience with that and genuinely thought it was interesting. After a while, that conversation was kind of dead and I didn't really have much else to say. Plus, it was getting late and I kind of wanted to go to bed. So I told him and after about 10 minutes of laying in my bed trying to sleep, I got another notification. I glanced at it real fast and this dude had honestly sent me a novel. After this event, I swiftly deleted the account, so unfortunately I don't have access to the exact messages, so I'm going to do my best to remember it. But the first one went a little something like, look, I'll be honest, I really want to keep talking to you. In fact, I'd actually really like to take you on a date sometime. You seem like a really nice girl and really sweet and interesting. I think we would get along extremely well. I'm kind of alone in this world. Insert long-winded commentary about his loneliness here, and he also did not use any punctuation, so it took me a while to actually dissect all of the message. I responded and told him that I wasn't interested. He was about seven years older than me, too. I was 20 at the time, though, and tried to just say goodnight again. Then, he responded with another novel along the lines of, I don't think you understand. You are perfect for me. You were made for me, I'm sure of it. God speaks to me, you know. God wants us to be together and we will be. One day, you will be mine. I'm trying to be polite because he was so nice earlier and I guess I'm naive or something. I don't totally know, but I kept responding, trying to let him down easy. And here are some more of the highlights. He says, maybe not today and maybe not tomorrow, but God has decided this. Who are we to deny him of his plan? Someday in the future, we will end up together. You will realize it soon. We're going to have three children. I know their names. Two boys, one girl. God spoke their names to me. I wrote them down when I was seven years old and I still have the paper. Do you know how I know you're going to be my wife? Because I wrote your name down with it. You will be my wife. Don't make a mistake. God is talking to me now. He's saying your name to me. I can't let you leave. And at that point, I blocked and reported him, noped the hell off the site, and went to bed, all creeped out. Morning came though, and he had found me on Facebook, and he was going on and on and on, starting with comments along the lines of, where did you go? How could you do this to me? You're denying your fate. And he did it all night long, literally all night. I freaked out, told him to leave me alone pretty aggressively and blocked him. I deleted all of the social media apps off of my phone for the next few days. I asked my roommates to stay at home with me. They agreed after I told them what had happened. And I was actually genuinely afraid that this dude was going to come and find me. I mean, he was local and I had made nice conversation by telling him my major and some clubs I was in. He could have showed up anywhere, but thankfully, he didn't and that was the end of that. For now at least. A couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in my car in a parking lot on the lake, waiting on a friend. The lot had a few cars in it, and it was only about 5pm, so it was in no way dark or empty, and I felt completely safe. I was just mindlessly scrolling through Reddit when I saw a truck pull up on my passenger side. I looked up for a second, but didn't think much of it. 
I mean, it wasn't super close to me, but maybe a parking spot or two between us. Pretty much as soon as I looked back down to my phone, the truck peeled off so quickly it startled me and I looked back up. It quickly did a U-turn in front of my car and sped up next to my drive side, barely missing hitting me and stopping so close to me that he was blocking my door and part of the front of my car with his truck, making it impossible for me to get out or drive away. There were three men in the car, all smiling at me so big and creepily that the whole thing just sent shivers down my spine. What you doing, hun? The driver asked in a flirty tone. I tried to hide how startled I was and responded as nonchalantly as I could muster. Just waiting on my boyfriend? He'll be here any minute. His smile instantly dropped into a scowl and never returned. Is he big? His expression in combination with his words made it feel like a threat. I'm a petite young girl that waits tables and bartends. I've been in similar situations many times before. I know from experience the only way to handle these guys is confidently. They come on stronger when they can sense you're nervous. I laughed loudly and answered. Judging by your truck? Yeah, he's bigger than you where it matters. Do yourself a favor and leave before he gets here, alright? I thought that I had them. I mean, why would they be interested in a girl that mocks your truck and your dick, right? But boy, I was wrong. Well, how about you just get out of here before he shows up, and I can show you I ain't compensating for nothing. He didn't say it flirtatiously. He was pissed when he said it, I could tell. These guys were already creeping me out, but now I was terrified I was going to be kidnapped. The parking lot wasn't empty, but as I was waiting on someone to meet me, I parked as far away from the other cars as I could. It also dawned on me in this moment that most of these cars were probably empty since most people would probably be out at the lake, as this is a boat launch. It didn't help too that they looked huge. I'm 95 pounds at 5 feet tall, and the boyfriend that I was meeting was not much bigger. I continued trying to joke the whole thing away, but these men were not laughing. The driver was getting angrier and angrier the longer we spoke, I was getting annoyed too, making less jokes, telling them more straight up to just leave me alone, but they just wouldn't leave. I'm not sure if it was out of fear or pure annoyance, but adrenaline kicked in hard at this point, and I just started screaming at them, fuck my boyfriend, I'm gonna beat your ugly asses myself if you don't get the hell out of my face in 10 seconds. As I dramatically threw off my seatbelt, pulled my seat away from the steering wheel and pretended to start climbing out of my passenger seat as they still had my driver's side door blocked. It was at this point that they hurried off yelling about how nobody's friendly anymore, and thank God that they didn't hang around long enough to see my tiny self hop out of my car, or the size of my friend. So I literally just got off work about an hour ago, and I'm honestly debating if I even want to go back tomorrow. So I work for a food truck and our trucks are based out of a joint building. The building is a really old historical building. It used to be an old skating rink back in the 60s or around that general time period. But now the building is composed of the food truck business, a bakery and a solar panel company. All located in different sections, mind you. The bakers that come overnight to do their work have told me that they've experienced strange things like disembodied voices and things disappearing and reappearing and everyone just being confused but eventually getting used to the activity. There was one elderly baker that told me that he would hear the sound of roller skates rolling across the floor or footsteps coming from the stairs when he was working alone at night. And it didn't just happen once. I always hate coming in late at night and finishing up work while my manager finishes the CDL inside the office. I'm normally pretty okay when I'm alone anywhere, but I absolutely hate being alone in there specifically. I've never experienced anything creepy in my job. That is, until this night. I brushed off all the paranormal stories that the bakers would tell me and not pay any mind to it, especially when I'm alone at work. So basically, I finished up some dishes and I locked the doors. I flicked the lights off and started making my way towards the exit at the end of the large hallway. I turned around to close the door behind me and to lock it, when suddenly I paused. And I noticed something that, honestly, I will never be able to unsee. At the end of the hall towards the baking area, I saw this really, really tall, solid black figure of a man. It looked like he was wearing a... A suit and a hat maybe? 
He was towering too, probably like eight feet tall. My heart and stomach instantly just dropped and my body just felt like it was vibrating. My eyes were probably as wide as a barn owl's and I got a cold sweat in my hands almost instantly. I didn't breathe or gulp or anything, I was honestly just scared stiff. He didn't move or anything and he just stood there, ominously. I couldn't see his face but just his silhouette. His silhouette was also just pitch black, like the blackest black I've ever seen. I don't know how long I was staring at whatever it was but I closed the door as soon as my brain and body would allow me. I locked it and then I just went straight to my car. I feel bad for not telling my manager that I left but I just didn't want to sit around any longer especially since we're surrounded by woods here. I had the creeps all the way home and I still do now and I really do not want to go back there. So this is not my story, but my boss's story. She told me the story a while ago as well, and I thought that you guys would enjoy it. So, she has four children, and when they were younger, she was driving along in one of those seven-seater people carriers when it broke down on the side of the motorway. She pulled over onto the hard shoulder and put on her hazard lights, got the kids out of the car and behind the barrier, and called the AA and her husband. All the standard stuff. About 10 or 20 minutes later, a car pulls up behind her with a rather good looking chap in it. He says that he lives just off the next turning and had seen her and decided to circle back to see if she needed any help. All the way through this, my boss says that he didn't throw up any red flags. He just seemed genuinely concerned about the kids being on the side of the road and offered to take her back to his for a cup of tea to wait for the AA. He even said that you can call the AA and your husband to tell them where you are just to be safe again my boss is very sweet and kind and thinks the best of people and still no red flags she turns him down only because she had four kids with her she said that if she'd been on her own she probably would have taken him up on the offer as he seemed so genuinely kind she turned him down because she didn't want to take the children back to the stranger's house not because of mistrust he sort of pushed it a little bit more and then just shrugged and left a couple of weeks later though she saw his photo in the paper he had stopped to help another woman who had broken down and he had murdered her after offering her a lift. To this day, she maintains that she genuinely didn't see any red flags and the only reason she's alive is because of her kids. About 10 years ago, I was fresh out of college and trying to figure out what to do next. I went to college on an athletic scholarship and I was just as interested in enjoying my college experience as I was completing it. I ended up with a communications degree, average grades and pretty much no experience. I was working just as a door host or a bouncer at a smaller bar or lounge in a casino. I worked at said bar Wednesday to Sunday from around 7pm to 3am. My job was basically to just greet people coming in, check IDs, break up fights and remove people who got out of hand while maintaining a professional and friendly manner. Now, there was a man that started coming into the bar on the off nights, Wednesday or Thursday when it was slow. He would come in both nights one week and then not come in again for three weeks or so and then he would do the same thing always on the off nights. Usually he would talk to me a couple of times throughout the night when he was just there, just normal small talk. It was never awkward too and he was always well dressed in a suit or at least a button up shirt and slacks. He was clean, had an athletic build, no visible tattoos or piercings and a shaved head. Now I'm not into men but I would guess that he was a good looking man in his late 30s. And well the last night I saw him the conversation was a, a bit different. So he came in on an off night like normal and eventually came up to talk to me by the door. The conversation started off normal, but eventually he asked me if I enjoyed what I did at the bar. I did the typical, it's not that bad, it's mostly easy, dissembling what I felt was polite conversation. He asked me how long I'd been a bouncer for, asked if I thought about making any more money, and eventually dragged out of me that, no, I didn't particularly enjoy being a bouncer and didn't know what I was going to do with my future. And at this point, he looked me straight in the face and said... Well, you could kill people. While maintaining our eye contact, I paused and waited for some type of joke or smile or something that would turn this into a failed attempt at a joke. But no, 
there was nothing. He seemed 100% serious and there was no smile, no joke, nothing but him just staring at me, waiting for me to respond. At this point, I tried to tell him the first thing that came to mind. I said, uh, I'm pretty sure I don't have the skill set for what I think you're suggesting. He said, yeah, but you could learn all about that. Think about it. You could travel, work once or twice a month and get paid really well. Well, strangely, at that point in my life, it was an intriguing idea. I immediately thought of some sort of police setup and all the shadowy hitmen handle the portrayals that I've seen in every hitman movie ever. So, I told him, Nah, I just don't think that's for me. And then he said, Okay, and just left. And I worked there for another year and I never saw him again. I want to preface this story by stating that I've had my fair share of encounters with creepy men. This situation, however, scared the life out of me and it's the first time that I genuinely felt like my life was in danger. So my husband and I had to drive 17 hours last week to North Carolina for a wedding. It was an exhausting week and we basically spent the entire time just rushing from one family gathering to another. We were staying in a motel for the time that we were there and we had already been at this motel for a few days by the time that the day of the actual wedding rolled around. The day of the wedding was absolutely hectic. We were rushing around trying to get ready to leave for the venue and my husband got ready before me so he could do some last minute things before we had to leave and that left me alone in our motel room to get ready before he returned. It was brutally hot outside and I decided to do my hair and makeup in just my underwear so I wouldn't be sweating in my nice dress the whole time. The way that this motel was laid out, the sink and mirror were in the general open area of the room with the toilet and the shower in another room. So, anyone walking by our window could see me standing at the mirror. However, I did have the curtains closed, but these curtains were a little bit sheer, so you could technically see the shadow of someone walking by on the outside. Or could maybe see the silhouette of me inside the room as well. So, I was curling my hair in the mirror when I noticed the silhouette of a man walking by the room window. As he's passing my window, I see him stop and start trying to look into my window. At first, I thought it was my husband trying to see if I was ready, so I paid it no mind. But the longer the guy stood there, bobbing his head around trying to get a better look through the curtains, I began to realize that it was not my husband. Because, obviously, why wouldn't he just come in? Now I'm starting to get a little bit freaked out, I must admit, but before I could do anything, watch as this guy starts to go for my room door. My utter shock and horror came when he actually was able to open the door too and walked inside. Before my husband left, he'd obviously forgot to pull the door shut all the way till it clicked into its lock. He was really upset with himself when I told him this later as well. So now I'm face to face with this man and I'm in my underwear no less, who's at least six feet tall and just standing in my room. I thought to myself, this is it, he's going to attack you. That's a very scary realization to have, I tell you, and I also thought to myself, you're going to have to burn his eye sockets out with this curling iron if you want to survive. For a few seconds, probably only a second or two, but it felt a lot longer. He just stood there staring at me like I was a piece of meat and he was starving, ready to pounce on me like prey. He then began to smile the most evil looking toothy grin that I've ever seen and started mumbling something under his breath. I didn't make out what he was saying completely, but I did make out the words pretty lady and come here. I don't know if it was the fight or flight response, but I suddenly got pissed and I charged towards him, ready to strike him with the hot curling iron. I screamed as loud as I could, get the hell out of here. It must have startled him because he jumped back out onto the balcony of the motel. I saw this as my chance and I ran for the door. I luckily was able to get to the door and slam it shut right before he was able to make his second attempt at entering inside. I immediately collapsed on the floor just sobbing after this and I was literally too scared to move from that spot until my husband came back about 15 minutes later. I told him the whole thing and he was obviously freaked out. He initially wanted to find the guy so that he could beat the crap out of him but I refused to let him leave my side. He must have apologized a thousand times during the rest of our trip for not making sure that the door was locked before leaving. 
but I told him that the day and that whole trip really was so rushed that I could see how it happened. We eventually went to the motel management and told them the whole story and the police were obviously called and I gave them a description of the guy so that they could see if there was someone who was staying in the motel that looked like that. After going around to the few motel occupants, they said that no one matched his description and concluded that he wasn't staying here. Obviously, we were late to the wedding that day and the whole experience just ruined what should have been a really happy time. We planned on staying another day before our long drive home, but we both just wanted out of there as soon as possible at that moment. So we skipped most of the reception and we went back to the motel, packed up and we just left. I am usually always so vigilant with locking my doors, especially when I'm home alone. It just goes to show you, I guess, that all it takes is that one time that you forget to check your locks, and that certain unwanted guest is inviting themselves right in. About a year and a half back, I was a sheriff's deputy that had been transferred to the jail division. I started out on night shift and being the most recent addition, I spent a lot of nights in the housing bubble. Sometimes I would be sitting there after lights out and I would see out of the corner of my eye the orange striped shirt of an inmate running by housing. I would think to myself, why is the inmate worker just messing around like that? Then I would realize that I didn't have an inmate worker that night. Or on occasion, I could swear that I saw someone walking on the upper level of one of the pods as well. I got to a point where I would honestly just blow it off as me being overly tired. But then one night, something happened that I just couldn't brush off anymore. So I was sitting in the back of the housing watching YouTube. I would usually watch Cops After Lights Out. And well, I started hearing tapping. Like someone was tapping their fingers on the control desk. A steady and yet quick three taps and then three taps again and again. And I'm thinking to myself, what's wrong with the computer? Why is it making that noise? So I'm staring at the main desk and the trash can underneath the desk just flips up about five inches from the ground and moves to the side about a foot and then sits back down, like someone was moving it out of their way. And I just kind of sat there. I didn't have any feelings of dread or fear. It almost felt like just another deputy was in there with me. I really don't feel like whatever it was meant me harm, but it was definitely an interesting moment, to say the least. I'd gone to bed for the night, but since I'm a pretty light sleeper, the sound of thunder awoke me about every hour. Around 3am, I decided that I just wasn't going to get much sleep tonight, and went downstairs to get a cup of water. I remember a strange feeling that night, like the air was charged, which I figure was probably just related to the storm. I make my way slowly down the steps, not wanting to wake my family. I enter into the dining room, which consists of a large table in the center of the room. Avoiding the table, I step to the left when a sudden flash of lightning illuminates the room. And that's when I notice the man standing not even one foot further to the left in the very corner of the dining room, looking down on me. He was white with black hair and, well, piercing blue eyes that glowed even after the lightning went out. He was well dressed and didn't seem to be wearing anything that struck me as out of place for the time period. It was his smile, though, that just made my blood run cold. He was grinning from ear to ear as if he was happy to see me, yet a negative energy just seemed to envelop the room. I was frozen from fear, unable to move and unable to think, unable to scream, and all I could do was watch as the blue eyes seemed to slowly melt into the wall until there was just no trace that the man had even been there. I scrambled back up the stairs, locked my door, and hid until morning, but I was unable to shake the feeling of just being watched the whole night. Daylight eventually came and I checked the whole house for the strange man that I'd seen the night before, but he had vanished. There hadn't been any kind of break-in and nothing was taken and oddly my family security system was still perfectly intact and nothing had been tripped. I'm a foreign student studying in a small town in Germany. At the time this particular event happened, however, I was still living in Berlin. I lived in an older apartment with an older lady who rented the unit to me. 
the kitchen connected the two apartments that she owns, so we technically live in separate units, but we share the kitchen. The star of our story, however, is not the lady. She's really nice, and I still even talk to her sometimes. The apartment building, though, is five stories high with a staircase, no elevator. We live in the second story. The lady who rented the unit to me, though, has always had a problem with the neighbors right downstairs because they were always noisy and they fought a lot, and when they were on their balcony, it always smelled heavily of smoke. The neighbors downstairs are an older couple, probably in their late 50s or early 60s if I had to guess. I didn't know much about them except for their phone number and their names, which the landlady scribbled on a piece of paper for me in case they ever got too loud so I could call them. Turns out, I never needed the number to get to know them because one afternoon, as I was cooking, the doorbell in the lady's apartment rang, but she was out. And not long after that, it rang on my side. So I thought it must be her trying to reach out or something, so I looked at the peephole and there stood some older lady, so I thought it must just be the landlady's friend. I opened the door and, to my surprise... There stood the said lady without any pants. As in, she was with a shirt but was in her underwear. Now, at that point, I was only in Germany for a couple of months, so I wasn't really sure if this was normal and my German was not also that good. This lady was mumbling something that I could barely make out, but since she rang the bell on the landlady's side first, I assumed she was looking for the landlady and I tried telling her with the best German that I could, that the landlady was out and will probably not be back until later. But this lady, she just stood there mumbling something. I really couldn't understand her, so I just shook my head apologetically and smiled. She began gesturing to me to come with her like she wanted to show me something. So I quickly turned off the stove and I followed her downstairs after grabbing my keys. She then started to ring a bell on the door right below us. And it was at this point that I was like, ah, oh, so this is the neighbor. But then came another wave of shock because after she repeatedly rang the bell, a man came to the door with no piece of clothing on except for his socks. I tried really hard not to make my weirded out face very apparent because I wasn't sure about German customs yet at that point and I didn't want to be rude. And all I could think about was, so this must be the husband. She gestured for me to come in and I was starting to wonder what her actual intention in calling me all the way down here was. I thought it was something important for the landlady but she just offered me something to drink and I declined but she insisted on getting me water anyway and walked into the kitchen. Now I'm still standing near the front door with this man who is now staring at me top to bottom. To be honest he looks kind of drunk and and right at that moment, I remembered how the landlady used to tell me that all they do is fight and get drunk. So I just smiled at him and stood there awkwardly, but he decided to suddenly be very friendly because he kind of just grabbed my shoulder and dragged me inside of the house to show me different rooms and the balcony and their small garden and everything. I mean, the house itself is beautiful, I must admit. A real contrast to the people living in it. It was very uncomfortable though to say the least because he was very much naked still and staying at a very close proximity to me. His arm was on my shoulders and he was just looking at my face so closely that I could feel his breath on my face. He then proceeded by asking if they had a beautiful garden and I just said yes and kind of laughed awkwardly. Thank god the wife came out from the kitchen at this point and then she started shouting at him for doing what he was doing. She told him that it was no way to treat a guest and she handed me a glass of water, all the while still wearing no pants. I never drank the water and I quickly excused myself saying that I needed to check my cooking upstairs. After some debate I got out of the house but the lady is still holding on to me at the door pleading that I could stay a while and sit at the garden with her. I was ready to come up with more excuses before someone came through the front door of the building and interrupted. It was the young man that lives two stories above us. Apparently, he just got back from grocery shopping and he somehow dealt with them and told me to go back upstairs. So I went and waited upstairs to thank him. He was done talking to them after about two minutes and he came upstairs to ask if I was alright and told me not to get mixed up with those folks because they're apparently known to be very problematic. So yeah, he saved my day and I thanked him for that. After that experience though, I kind of just hurried my way up to my apartment every time that I got back from somewhere so I didn't run into them. 
I actually met her once more after that. She looked sober and was actually wearing pants this time. She didn't seem to recognize me though, and thankfully, I have since moved far away from there. So I've shared before one of my more recent experiences and I experienced that activity in my family's last house that was so bad that we actually had to move out in the end. So I figured that I should share a few more of the stories. So the house was normal at first but the first thing that really was a red flag were the footsteps. And they'd usually happen when only one person was home. I remember hearing them multiple times. It sounded like someone walking and sometimes even running down the small upstairs hallway that led to my sister's bedroom. But one day, I was at summer school in the middle of the day, about 1pm, and I get a text from my sister asking if I've heard footsteps upstairs. I tell her yes, and she tells me that she thinks she's hearing them, but doesn't respond after that. After I get home, my mum tells me that she came home to my sister, sitting outside the house. Apparently, she had heard loud footsteps and went upstairs to investigate, finding my parents' bedroom door open. But this is strange too because my mum always closes it before she leaves the house. My sister then closed the door, only to hear what sounded like loud running coming from inside the room. And needless to say, that was enough to scare her straight outside. About a few months pass and the footsteps are a common phenomenon at this point, my mum tells me that my sister's phone even got flung off her bed by itself at one point. But anyways, it's late at night and I normally get up to get some water or snacks. My bedroom is the only one downstairs, everyone else is asleep upstairs. The kitchen is only three or four feet from my room. I open my door and I'm basically just standing there and after walking in, the pantry light is on, which is odd because my dad would always turn it off before he went up to bed. I brushed it off though as maybe one of my sisters went and got some food, same idea as me. I step into the pantry to see what snacks we have available when I hear a drawer open. I could hear the wheels hit the end of the track and some metal clang around briefly, meaning the drawer had been pulled open all the way. I pick my head out and sure enough the silverware drawer is wide open. I close that drawer and then I just ran back to my room. Weird occurrences continued and my mum constantly complains how lights in her bedroom will turn on by themselves and she'd even see a shadow of a little girl running around her bed. The master bedroom seemed to be a hotspot for activity and I had no idea what people meant when they said that they felt that they were being watched until being in that room. I always had the urge to look into the mirror or check over my back. You could just kind of tell that something was there. It's hard to explain, but if you've experienced it, you'll know what I'm talking about. This comes into play late one night too. So, I'd been over at a friend's house the next city over, about a 15 minute drive. I often get home late and everyone's asleep. It's about 11.30, so I quietly unlock the door and walk in when I see my mum standing in the front room holding one of our dogs. My mum is usually out by nine and very rarely gets up and leaves a room which meant that something strange was definitely happening. And she tells me that she saw a huge shadow figure, like a full man standing in the hall that leads to her bathroom. Also, for whatever reason, she left my little sister in the master bed by herself, and my dad was asleep on the couch. I can't just leave her in there if there's some huge shadow man, demon or poltergeist or whatever it is in there with her. So I go back upstairs with my mum and check on my sister. She's fast asleep and my mum is visually shaken and points out that her shower door was not open when she left the room. Sure enough, it was pulled wide open at this point. Eventually, we all just went to the bed. There's nothing we can really do and we just try to forget it. I have a few more stories if anyone wants to hear them. I strongly believe that my family is followed by something, but I can't be too sure. When I was 14, I was taking 3D modeling class at my online school and had a teacher whom I'll call John Doe for the sake of privacy. He was around 60 at the time and John Doe was a little, well, friendly. 
We would always ask to Skype and would talk about subjects unrelated to school. If I only had my audio on, he'd ask for me to turn on my video. He'd also ask me to lower my camera when I was wearing tank tops and whatnot. He'd say that I was the most beautiful girl in Hawaii and would tell me how lovely I looked and be very complimentary. He sort of opened up to me as well in a way that was unusual for a teacher to do so. He also always gave me A pluses, so I appreciated that. But I knew something was weird when I never had an imperfect score, ever. My 14-year-old self had never had someone open up in that way, so I just went along with it. It actually kind of intrigued me, if I'm being honest. I didn't mind too, because he always gave me perfect grades and was always flattering towards me. He'd look at my chest when we were on Skyping and would always compliment my physical appearance. He'd say that we should meet sometime in person and asked where I lived. He'd say that he'd swing by, even though I was far too young to just hang out and talk. He said that he'd love to see me in person, and that just never really materialized, though. So this complimentary behavior in Skyping, though, it went on for months until he just randomly disappeared from school and Skype. I started researching his name and found out that he had commented on girls around my age's YouTube accounts with similar jargon. I don't know the reason as to why he was dropped or resigned from the school. All I know is that he was... And I never heard from him again or of him again. When I was that age, I didn't think anything was wrong with his behavior, but now I feel it's apparent that it was definitely inappropriate. And I'm glad that nothing happened. This story happened when I was 12 years old. I'm female and 25. And I remember that it was a Saturday night around 9 or 10 p.m. during summertime. I owned one dog at the time. His name was Benny. My parents decided that night they feel like going for a walk around the block, walking Benny and asked me whether I wanted to join them. I said no because I wanted to play PWI on my PC, Perfect World International. My parents were okay with leaving me alone since the walk wouldn't take longer than 30 minutes tops. As my parents would get dressed to leave the house, I logged into PWI and looked around at my guild and global chat to see if anyone was on. For some reason, no one was, so I decided to join my parents. I get dressed, I put Benny on his leash, and we all leave. I'd like to mention, too, that I lived in an apartment building that had 10 floors, and we lived on the first floor. I'm not really sure how to explain it, too, but you have the basement of the building and then the first row of the apartments. But basically, you enter the building and you're already facing apartments, and I lived in the very first one. I remember always hating that too, because whoever would pass by our door, we would hear them at any time of the day or night. Whoever was lurking at night, we would hear them as well, and it was somewhat eerie to live on floor zero. Anyway, we leave the house and my dad closes the door. We had three keyholes and a steel bar that would block the door from the inside. The bar covered half of the door. Precautions were my father's obsession. We exit the building and enjoy our walk. After 15 minutes, we realize that the wind has changed from warm summer wind to incoming storm wind. My mum makes the call to go back home as Benny already did all of his duties, so we all return. We open the building door, climb the five stairs to our door and attempt to open it, and my father does the following. He unlocks the first three locks and then attempts to unlock the metal door that holds the door locked. And at that attempt, my father pauses, turns around at us with the most serious face that I've ever seen on him, and whispers for us to call the police and ring the neighbor's door. My mom goes to the second apartment, and the neighbor, who I'll call Ted, comes out asking my father what had happened. My dad whispered to him, covering the see-through hole of the door, that someone was in our house. He or they are holding the door, Please stay here with my family and make sure not to open it. I'll be back. After saying that, I see my father rush all by himself around the building in the dark. I say dark because we didn't have any street lights on the side of our apartment facing the block garden. But my dad disappears into the darkness and I go outside too, not following him too much but only to hear if he's in trouble. He's my dad, don't judge me. And as soon as I get out, I hear him shout, Hey you, come back. Who the hell do you think you are? I've called the police. At the same time I hear him shout, I look at Ted who manages to open the door and enter the house at that point, and I go after them and enter my house. 
It no longer felt like my house too because in just 15 minutes while we were walking, the home invaders made a complete mess of our house. All of our shelves and wardrobes were pulled out, our clothes scattered just all over the house. Benny's dry food was all over the floor, indicating that they must have tripped in his bowls or something, probably not knowing that we owned a dog. But what scared me the most was how organized they were. I say they too because after seeing the disaster that was left behind, we knew that it was pretty much impossible for just one person to hold the door, steal, and organize what they would want to take with them. I also say organized because the thieves put in our living room all packed and ready what they wanted but couldn't steal. On the couch, they placed our laptops, one of our TVs, my father's collections of coins, our phones, chargers, wallets, and even my father's camera. He's a photographer and that week he had to attend a wedding. They didn't have enough time to steal all of that, so they just settled with one of my mum's jewellery and pocket money and whatnot. After seeing this, in my silly child mind, I rushed to my room to check my piggy bank. I always saved up money from whatever chores I did. It wasn't much, but it was my work and savings, and at that time, I thought that they stole it too. When I enter my room, I see the metal bars covering my windows, I cut open, and my window's broken. Which means that this is how they entered, through my room. My room is the only room facing the side of the building, and the one most secluded from views. Needless to say... I never felt safe in my room in which I had to live for the next 10 years of my life in until I moved into my own place with my fiancé. The police arrive though and they start throwing white dust. I have no idea what it actually is, but it was all over our house to find fingerprints. They take pictures, take our statements, analyze my room and window. They were unable to catch the home invaders, but were able to tell that this invasion was not the only one in our neighborhood. During that month, allegedly, another four houses were broken into, one of them being the home of a cop, not related with the cops at our home. They told us that the invaders analyzed their victims, learned their schedule, even knew where the children's rooms were, as they seemed to be entering the houses through the children's windows. All the families affected by them had children. But they didn't expect us to be back that soon and panicked, hence one of them was holding the door with his body so the others could flee. The person after which my dad was shouting was probably the one holding the door and escaping last through my broken window. I don't know what could have happened if I didn't change my mind and give up on raiding for gears and PWI. I would probably have come face to face with these invaders and I'm really happy that I didn't and I hope to God that I never meet them again. So this happened about two years ago now. I got divorced and moved in with my mum on our family farm in rural South Georgia. The house we moved into was my grandmother's childhood home. It's huge and surrounded by our produce field. When I first moved with my boys, aged two and four at the time, they honestly loved it. It has so many rooms and had so much more space to run and play than our crappy little apartment in Orlando. As time went on though, they started saying little things such as, there are monsters upstairs. And the funny thing is, every morning I would shut the doors upstairs, they unsettled me too. Every morning I would wake up and they would be open again. I always chalked it up to the old house just having drafts. But eventually the boys didn't like being alone in certain rooms or in the house alone at all. During the time I spent there, I did notice little things. And now that I look back, I think they must have seen more than I did. After about two years though, I finally found a good man. Well, we started off slow with small little casual dates. He even included the boys, which was very surprising and different. We were inseparable, even if it was just sitting around the house. One night though, we decided to sit outside and talk. The boys and my mum were inside asleep. My room was across the house, so we decided to call my phone and put it on speaker. We muted his phone and also put it on speaker. We sat on the porch and we talked for hours until early in the morning, when all of a sudden we both froze mid-conversation because we could hear a man speaking through the phone in my bedroom. He isn't saying something that we can make out, but the voice is terrifying. But the creepy thing is that my son is sleepily mumbling back to the man. 
It was at this point that we both just looked at each other and took off, bursting into the house to find both of my boys still sound asleep and the room silently empty. I don't know why, but it bothers me after all these years. Because who was talking to my son that night? This event took place not too long ago. It happened on a Wednesday night when me and my best friend decided to go clubbing. Neither of us are actually club people, but it was free for ladies and a local rock band was performing. They're pretty famous around here, so we figured why not. It's been a while since we've gone out at night anyway. Nothing particularly interesting happened at the club as it was heavily overpopulated. But when the show was over, we decided to leave as it started getting even more populated with new people coming in. It was hard to keep up a conversation because we literally had to scream over each other and, in worst cases, even push to get past the mass. So instead, we just walked around the old town and chit-chatted a bit. The old town was fairly quiet, except for the few ambulances trying to aid a drunk guy who hit his head on the pavement or something. After a while, we both decided to just go home and I had to get a taxi because it's quite a long trip, one hour at least, and there's no way that I was going to walk this path alone as it tends to get quite dangerous at night. She lived closer to the city centre and in another direction, so she decided to just walk home instead. After I had ordered my taxi, we parted ways and I had to wait 10 minutes at least, so I decided to sit down on a bench nearby the bus stop and this is where it began. So I was scanning the area when I glanced over to the bus stop on the other side of the road and I noticed a dark greyish SUV parking right next to it. Right as I looked towards it, he started waving for me to come closer. I was confused and looked around again to see if there were more people around and when I glanced again he tried to pull the same gesture but I didn't respond like before. And that's when he slowly started to drive. I had a bad gut feeling instantly kick in and then he pulled right up next to me as I feared. He rolled his windows down and yelled, I'm Ricardo. I'm not even sure if that's his real name. The guy seemed to be way older than me, almost twice my age in fact. He appeared to be in his late 30s or early 40s and seemed to be either Puerto Rican or perhaps Colombian or something. Now, I know sometimes people tend to pick others up if their destination is on their radar, but... I had a strong gut feeling that he had other things in mind. When I told him that I was waiting for a taxi, he kept insisting that I should cancel it and get in his car. He also called me baby a few times and the red flags definitely kicked in even more at this point. He asked for my name and I blurted out a random name that popped up in my head at the time. He took out his hand and wanted to shake hands and I stood up slowly but something just told me not to do it. And that was when I got a small peek into his car and I'm pretty sure that there appeared to be some sort of ropes or wires on his back seat. And there was also a silver light slightly shining from a back seat in what I assumed to be duct tape. I immediately froze and told him that I'd rather not get too close with strangers. He tried to reassure me that he was a good guy and wouldn't hurt me. He started getting frustrated at this point and for some reason he thought that if he would say things like but you're so beautiful baby at least twice that I'd cool down and just get into his car or something. But no way was I ever going to get in with him. He seemed to get angry now but as it took place in the city centre and there were quite a few cars and other people around he just asked me if I was sure for the last time as if he'd hope I'd change my mind or something to his offers that he made and I blew him off for the last time and that's when he finally left. He didn't even say goodbye or anything too, just kind of drove off like the wind. That's when I realized that he must have been waiting in that spot where I first had noticed him. I didn't see any cars passing by while I was sitting at the bus stop and it's also the exact spot where most people would go after a night out to order a taxi or perhaps go to McDonald's, whatever floats their boat. The club is located just southeast from the bus stop. A lot of girls were wasted that night, so he most likely wanted to take advantage of that too. When the taxi finally arrived, I texted my best friend, and I froze when she texted me that a creepy guy in a large SUV had stopped and mumbled something to her, and she ignored him and just kept on walking. Apparently, he attempted to follow her and kept shouting something, but since she had earphones on, she couldn't really make out what he was saying. 
when she ran in between the houses, he was gone. Luckily, she got home safely and so did I. But I guess the moral of the story is always be aware of your surroundings and listen to your gut feeling. I'd like to think that I was just overreacting, but something tells me that it would have been very different if we were in a more private and secluded area. Several years ago, I was working in a shopping mall as a marketing manager. When my job was very much in the public eye in my community, my main job was to get people into the shopping center, mostly by hosting events such as fashion shows, music events, and beauty pageants, mostly that I presented myself as well, so I was well known around town. Now, I had a group of friends that I had known since high school, and we saw each other pretty regularly. But when I was around 29, I had been married for four years and had just had my son. My friend Chrissy, not a real name by the way, had unfortunately just ended her second marriage. It was a running joke in the group that she really liked wedding cakes. She had just hooked up with a new man as well and wanted us to get together that weekend so she could introduce him. And in typical Chrissy fashion, there was around a month in time moving from husband number two to moving in with new man Jake. Again, not his real name. The meeting went off without an issue and we all attended, muttering between ourselves that it would never last. He was a lot older than she was, himself recently divorced with a very interfering ex as well. He was also definitely no oil painting. Around three weeks after though, Chrissy announced that she was pregnant. One day I walked into my office at the shopping mall to find a large bunch of roses and a teddy on my desk though. I received flowers regularly from suppliers, so it wasn't really a surprise, but the teddy was definitely new. I am not, and I never have been a teddy kind of girl. The small card just said, I can't wait to see you again. I asked the secretary if she knew where they came from, and she said that she had no clue. They were delivered to the security office before any of us arrived. And it was at this time that the phone calls started direct to my office phone skipping the reception. Only a few people knew this number and at first there were just silent calls with just heavy breathing on the line. After a few days of silence, he started to talk. Things like, I'm watching you. I like your skirt. You're beautiful. I wish you were my girlfriend. Each time I slammed the phone down, the voice was gravelly though and sounded as if the person was trying to make his voice deeper than it was. After daily calls for a week, I went to my boss who had the number changed and the calls thankfully stopped after this. Around a month after this, we hosted a get-together at my house and Chrissy and Jake attended. As he walked through the door and greeted me, I froze. As soon as he spoke, I knew immediately that it was him. Chrissy was by now very pregnant and I really didn't want to upset her, so I never told her. I confronted him about it and he apologized and said that he didn't mean to creep me out. They left early that day and they moved to another town a few months after. The marriage did happen and I was invited but I declined. The marriage lasted a year and Chrissy is now engaged again. In fact, she has been three times since her and Jake divorced. I did tell her about it a few years later and she said that she understood me not telling her at the time. She would have not believed me anyway. He must have got my number from her address book or something and he had apparently done this to another woman at their church straight after they moved. I've worked night audit for a new Bampton in one of the safest areas near me for a little over two years now. It's got direct access to two main highways. I've had a fair share of creepy guests and weirdos, but most were just easy check-ins and fixes, and then they're on their way. However, last night changed everything up. As safe as my property is, we do have a shady $40 a night motel on the other side of our building. There's been some stuff that's gone down at both places, and occasionally their guests try to sneak into my motel for a free breakfast. I have on two occasions seen the police raid both hotels and spend all night searching for people who ran and collected evidence, I presume. It's been a while since I've seen such entertainment though, so that's been nice. But anyway, it's about 2.30am and I'm getting ready to run my night audits. 
my doors are locked and this guy who is dirty but in a construction worker kind of way walks up. We have plenty of construction workers stay here as we aren't far from their site and we're rated number one in the area so I open the door for him and ask if he needs a room before I run the audits. He grins at me but it's anything but a warm welcome. It looks fake and almost threatening in fact and he looks at me for a second and then says that I have a guest in room 144. His wording caught me off guard. Not many say that they have a guest in a room. It's usually I'm here for or I'm meeting so and so. And the second issue is that we don't have a room 144 and neither do any of the brand names in my area. I've been to all the immediate ones so I inform him that we don't have a room 144 and he looks at me for a second and then says, Oh shucks, guess I got stood up giggles and then just walks out the door. But thinking that this is very odd but whatever, I go back to running the audit. As I'm finishing up, the phone rings and a guy starts chuckling and says that there's a car in your parking lot with its lights on. Oh, and by the way, I'm the guy that just got stood up. Now, one, it's been 30 minutes since he walked out my door. Why is he still in the parking lot? And two, and nobody has come or gone since him and there were no lights on in the parking lot before he came in. And three, why do I need to know that you're the guy who got stood up? I brush it off as odd but my gut is telling me that something weird is going on. I wait about five minutes and then walk around the front of the building from the inside and see no cars in my parking lot with lights on. It's not very well lit so it would be easy to spot back at the front desk waiting for the order to finish up its thing so I can get ready to start breakfast and the phone rings again. I pick it up and it's the creepy guy again telling me that there's a light on in the parking lot. It's been at least another 20 minutes since the last call so again why would he still be in the parking lot? I feel I may have missed something between the windows so I go to my locker door peek my head out real quick to do a swift scan of the lot and my eye catches someone standing in the corner of the parking lot. It's the creepy guy and he's just squatting there watching me. There's also no car with its lights on and I run back inside, double check that the doors are locked and I start to feel this sense of panic and something really bad is about to happen. I have never felt this feeling while on my shift and only once before in my life, and let's just say I have physical scars from what happened that time. So I get back to the front desk and I call the local PD and I explain the situation to dispatch and they ask if it's ever happened before. I tell them no, but also inform them that I'm the only employee on the property and I would like for them to scan the parking lot and check in with me if possible. PD pulls up and wants to get a description from me before searching the area. And well, as he's getting out of the car, he notices movement. Creepy guy took off. The cop walks in a little nervous and tells me what he just saw while using his radio to call for assistance. Three more show up and they discuss it, searching my parking lot and the two neighbor parking lots. They seem to come up with nothing but stick around to patrol the parking lot until the sun came up. PD has stopped by once since my shift started tonight to check on me and said that they would be in the area if I needed anything. And while here, they tell me that a total of three guys fled the parking lot from different directions last night. He believes that the creepy guy was trying to lure me into the parking lot away from the door so that I would end up trapped between the three of them. He didn't go much further as to what could have happened from there, but honestly, I don't want to dwell on it either. I was 13 years old in 2003 and my friend and I were bored and decided to have some weird fun one night. Now, I've always had interest in the supernatural and occult-like things. I've always been very empathic and in tune to things in a way that's hard to explain. But anyways, I didn't have a real Ouija board so we used paper and drew one and then used a quarter for the planchette. But we asked if anyone was there and if they wanted to talk. Nothing of course for a few minutes when suddenly... The feathers on my dream catcher in my room started to sway, with no window or air conditioner on too. We asked again if anyone was there, when suddenly it felt like there was a pull. 
but we allowed ourselves to let go and just see what happened, and it went to yes. We asked what its name was, and we felt pulled towards D and C, just the letters D and C, which was odd. A minute or so later, my grandma called for us that she was ready to go as we were about to go to the mall. We stood up and walked out of my room. My friend looked at my face and gasped and told me to look in the mirror. And I had a two inch or so scratch on my face that definitely wasn't there before. We were a little freaked out but mostly confused. But we went shopping and my grandma asked us what happened and I told her that I really didn't know. The next morning the scratch was gone too but... After that night, things got pretty weird. So my room for some reason started to feel colder than the rest of the house. Even my grandma commented a few weeks later that my room was just cold as death. My dog stopped coming into my room as well. He would stand at my doorway and I would call for him and he would just look at me and then leave. He might come in rarely for a minute or so but he would never stay. And then I started to get feelings like... I just wasn't alone in there. The air felt thicker, the dark seemed darker, and when I was home alone, I would hear things, footsteps and creaking. One night, though, it all came to a head. My grandparents went out to dinner, and I stayed home. I was downstairs playing on the desktop and instant messaging my friend. The bathroom door next to me that had been shut tight made a clicking sound, and the knob had turned, and the door opened slowly. I got up and slammed it shut and I went back to playing my game and instant messaging when I heard a loud crash. I got up and saw my grandma's crucifix that had been hanging on the wall had crashed to the floor. I put it back and turned on as many lights and the TV and just took my mind off of it all. Around this time my grandma, who is very Catholic, started getting into more new age things like crystals and psychics and whatnot. She went to she went to one and the psychic told my grandma that she had a granddaughter who saw orbs, but that these orbs that I'd been seeing were angels protecting me. It is true that I'd been seeing a lot of flashing lights that I called orbs in those months. Fast forward a year or so and some things happened to me that I won't go into here. Depression and hospitalizations and boarding schools. When I got home from boarding school, my grandma told me that she had spent a night in my room. She had laid down to sleep and suddenly heard a creaking noise. She said that she remembers thinking to herself, please don't start playing music. And then my music box just started playing. She said that she bought a lot of different incense and played a special prayer on repeat for days and basically prayer bombed the whole house. And when I returned home, my room just felt clean. Like whatever had been there was gone and it was safe. I stopped seeing orbs after that too and I never played with a Ouija board again, but I do love the designs, I admit. I have a Ouija board mug and a Ouija board mat on my dresser. I like the symbol and I'm not afraid of them, but I will never use one again, that's for sure. I'll admit though that I've been tempted through the years to try again, hoping that maybe being better prepared I can have a safer outcome, but I just don't know if I want to take that chance of opening a door to any stranger knocking. If anyone here has had any experiences, I would sure love to hear them as well in the comments below. Thanks for listening. So, I was up north in Shepherd, Michigan. I believe that that's the name, and it's a very small town, and this was about three summers ago, I think. I was visiting my best friend. We were really bored because her mum grounded her from her car and there's not really anything to do out there, so we decided to walk to downtown. I think it was about 8 or 9 p.m., I'd say, as the sun was going down at this point. The walk there was pretty long. We had to cross some dirt roads and follow a railroad track. By the time that we got there, it was dark and I had already wanted to go home because I don't like being outside in the country in the dark. It's just really creepy. But we sat at a park for a little bit on the swings. I noticed two sheriff police cars parked off at the end of the tiny strip that they call downtown, parked at this old car shop. According to my friend, they were most likely looking for two guys who had been car hopping a few nights before. 
We decided to start heading back because, well, we weren't even supposed to have left the house and her mum was threatening to lock us out for the night. It was like 10pm at this point and I wasn't looking forward to the long walk through the cornfields and railroad tracks in the pitch black night. So we were walking past the old car place about to turn the corner and I heard a loud helicopter. Apparently to my friend it's a police helicopter looking for the car hoppers. As a city girl I highly doubted that and thought it was pretty ridiculous but I also grew even more paranoid hoping that they wouldn't mistake us for the criminals. But we're passing the sheriff car and I'm trying to act so unsuspicious even though we didn't do anything wrong except walk the railroad tracks I guess. But anyways here's where things got a bit crazy. And this is by far the most bizarre thing that has ever happened to me. So we turn the corner and behind this downtown strip is a large grassy field and at the far end is a forest. At the edge of where this field meets the forest was this giant rod black thing just suspended mid-air, not much higher than the trees. It's kind of hard to describe but it was like two rods on top of each other. The top one extended a little bit more to the right and the bottom one to the left. At each end had very vibrant green lights, so two on each end and on the top and bottom. But maybe it was just because of how dark it was being in the country, but these lights didn't shine like normal to me. The color was just super vibrant and warm and glowed more than shined. And it was giant, like the size of a bus or two. At first I didn't understand what I was looking at. We heard a helicopter pretty loud actually, but I didn't see it anywhere. Just this thing hanging in midair. My friend, not a UFO or alien believer, thinks it's some sort of police aircraft looking for the car hoppers, which was very hard for me to believe at this point because if this was any kind of aircraft of ours, it would be locked up in Area 51 for sure. And definitely not out looking for car hoppers off a tiny little town. It didn't look like a plane as well. It was a rod. It had no wings or propellers. It made no sense how this giant heavy looking rod thing could just sit like that in midair. It was at a weird slant too, which I couldn't understand. I already had my phone out as a flashlight and I held my phone up to get a picture of it. And that was when this thing went spiraling towards us. Yeah, it literally spun like a fan directly at us and you could hear the wind cutting against it. I just froze and my face was twisted in the most ugliest way. I was just so stunned and not understanding what the hell was happening. My friend pushed my hands down so my phone was no longer pointing at the thing, and as quickly as it had started spinning towards us, it stopped. It repositioned itself, raised up a little bit, and then just started moving the opposite way, to cross over downtown, I suppose. And the helicopter that we heard had finally appeared and was in front of the rod thing, as if it was guiding it away or something. It wasn't a regular looking helicopter either. Or maybe it was just my hysteria or shock that made it look distorted, but it looked much rounder. The windows were bigger and all the lights were on inside, but I couldn't see anyone in there. And all of this was happening right above our heads. My friend might have been in denial, but I knew that that wasn't from this world as soon as I saw it. And I could see the ship more clearly and it had these intricate lines and designs on it too. Kind of like wires, but I'm not too sure. I don't remember it as clearly now and it was really dark but that definitely stood out to me and the feeling of seeing something, of having something above you that isn't from us, it's a bit of a crazy feeling let me tell you. Your brain is used to having a name for everything that we see and once it can't recognize something as something from humans, it's just a very strange overwhelming feeling and possibly a feeling that itself can't be registered or named yet, I'm not too sure. But yeah, we just slowly walked away and I kept glancing back a few times but I quickly stopped and just tried to get home as quickly as possible at this point. I always had wanted to get up and close and personal to a UFO. Life elsewhere is just so fascinating to me. I always wanted to see what they really look like. But after that, I must admit that I'm pretty terrified and will never chase down or even take a picture of a UFO if I ever see one that close again. I've seen a lot in my life, but that hands down was the scariest thing to ever happen to me, and I'd love to know if anyone else has seen something like that before as well. I've heard of the triangles, the bells, the saucers, cigars, and all sorts of stuff, but never what I've seen. If it was a secret military ship of some kind and they wanted to test it in a discreet area, 
why would they choose to test it right next to the only populated place in the town? By the way, there was definitely something more going on there than just some car hoppers. This happened maybe two years ago and is without a doubt the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. So me and my at the time roommate were just finished working out. It was about 8pm and the sun had already gone down. After walking out of the gym we decided to do a couple of laps at the nearby stadium before we go home. Nothing obscure happens on the way there but once the stadium comes into view we realize the floodlights are turned off. This didn't deter us as we were pretty certain we could run in the dark either way. We went to the bottom row of the seats to leave our gym bags there and as we were placing our bags we started hearing it. It was whistling, coming from the top rows, right above us. But not only was the very fact that someone was sitting in the dark the entire time unnerving, but the whistling itself was pretty bone-chilling. I don't know if I can explain it properly like this, but it was three low-pitched whistles, then a higher pitch, then one lower pitch, and then it would repeat. It sounded like whatever was making it wanted us to come to it. We were pretty unnerved, like I said, so we whispered to each other to grab the bags and then jog to the other side of the stadium and just get out. We took our bags and started jogging, and almost immediately afterwards, the whistling just stopped. As I could hear nothing else but our feet stomping on the ground and heavy breathing, I just figured that it had grown bored and just went away. But just then, I started hearing something. I could hear a third set of feet running behind us, my stomach dropped as I realized that whatever that was, was running towards us. Our adrenaline kicked in and we started booking it to the exit. As we were getting closer to the exit, I could hear it again, whistling, but this time, about 10 feet away from me. We made it past the exit and out onto the streets, and we didn't quit running until another block down. We stopped to catch our breaths, and whatever was chasing us had quit at the stadium exit. Only me and my roommate know about this story, and... But we've never really talked about it, but that whistling is the most disturbing thing that I've ever heard. When I was 12, I decided making a newspaper for my entire neighborhood was a really great idea. My friend and I, both avid fiction wannabe authors and generally just cringy middle-aged school nerds, decided to get together once a month and write absolutely enthralling articles about the weather or when the pool would be open and then deliver our front-back one-page newsletter to every single house in our two-street neighborhoods, whether they wanted it or not as well. And we kept this up for about two years, until the time of this story. So, we were on our once a month paper route, if you could call walking around our small neighborhood and putting a single sheet of paper in every mailbox a paper route. It was raining this particular time, so we had umbrellas and were carefully walking to each mailbox, trying to keep our newsletter as dry as possible. This also meant that all the cars that came by had their headlights and windshield wipers on, and also made sufficient noise with their tires splashing through the puddles. But my point is, is that we knew when a car was approaching behind us. So we were about halfway through on a street that we weren't so familiar with, the one we didn't live on, when we noticed this souped up old white car coming really slowly up the street. Now, the way my neighborhood was set up, the only reason why you would be on the same street as us is if you live there or you made a wrong turn. So there were even less cars on this street and the ones that passed usually were people that we knew. We continued walking from mailbox to mailbox while periodically checking to make sure the white car wasn't just parked. It was moving too, but so slowly and the headlights and the windshield wipers were either broken or just not turned on. This car drove slowly past us as we walked, going roughly the same pace as our steps if not slower. And something was definitely really off about everything. There was no reason for this car to be on this road in the first place. We definitely didn't recognize it or the driver inside, and it was going so incredibly slow. Car trouble? I don't know, but it was weird. We pretended one of the houses was ours, and we walked up the driveway to avoid the car as it got close to us. It continued at the same pace, and we watched it until it eventually disappeared around the corner. We just laughed about it, thinking that it was weird, but nothing happened. 
it was all well and good again until the car showed up at the end of the street behind us again, going just as slowly as it had before. What was this person doing? We were so confused and walked a little farther from the curb to avoid the car again as it came by. We didn't laugh about it this time though because we both could sense that there was danger lurking. And the car showed up a third time at the end of the street too. And at this point, we decided that we should cut through some of the yards to just get home. Better safe than sorry, right? So we crossed the street but the car passed again and we just shrugged it off and we just kept going. But the fourth time this car came around, it pulled right up next to us and the driver had his window down. Being 12 and living in a bubble, my friend and I hadn't quite been exposed to the world of drugs and junkies, but we knew something was up with this guy. He had a white towel draped over half his head, was wearing a white tank top, while we were in long sleeves and rain jackets, had his windows down and when he spoke, his speech was slurred. We were polite and we said hello and he asked us what we were doing through his open window. We continued walking as this interaction took place because we knew this dude seemed sketchy. But at the same time we didn't want to assume anything and just be rude. When we told him that we ran a newspaper, he immediately perked up and enthusiastically asked about placing an ad. He also took his hands off the steering wheel and leaned over so that he could get closer to the window. And boy... Did he smell of cigarettes? My friend and I looked at each other. We knew that something was wrong at this point. We told him no, we don't place ads in our newspaper, even though we did. Quite the entrepreneurs at 12, right? And then he told us that we were pretty girls and probably cold, right? Our idea to cut through some yards was decided. We hurriedly said something about needing to go home and he began shouting at us from inside the car as we crossed the street. We bolted to a neighborhood's backyard when we heard the car begin to move quickly and hid in some bushes until we were sure the car was gone. And after that, we just stopped writing our newsletter. Meeting a creepy person while you're alone in the rain in your own neighborhood was a good deciding factor for just calling it quits. In the end, nothing happened. and I'm really glad for that, but... It definitely could have gone very, very different. What happened has bothered my sister for just years. And my family has finally talked her into maybe going into therapy to talk about it because she still feels guilty about it. She wanted me to share it here just to get it out there and just to have it written down somewhere as well. So in 2013, my sister was 11 and she was friends with this girl who I'll call Becky. She wasn't her best friend, but she was really close to her. My sister had known Becky since junior school and she would always come around to play out with my sister and her other friends, so we saw her all the time as well. I was 13 at the time and because me and my sister are typical sisters, we used to terrorize each other. I would make fun of her in front of her friends and she would do the same to me. Me and Becky, though, we got along really well, and she was honestly just so funny, and she was nice and friendly, and I used to joke all of the time that I wish I could swap my sister for her. And this is honestly how close we all were. We had a tight bond. So, there's these fields near our house, which we would always play on. It's by the sea, so there's lots of sand hills and long grass. There's also a small hut with sports equipment in it. I mention this because police mentioned it a lot. I think that they thought that it was a potential hiding spot, but I'm not too sure. But anyway, my mum would always send me to go and get my sister when it was time for her to come home. Becky lived the opposite side of the field, so we would go one direction while she would go the other. This was pretty normal. Before you say that we should have walked her home, I, I know that we should have, but at the time we just never thought anything bad would ever happen. On that night though, I'd gone to get my sister at 7pm and when I got to the field, she had her back to me looking over the fields. I asked her where Becky was and she said that she was on her way home. I couldn't see Becky anywhere but at the time I didn't think anything of it and my sister was acting normal so we just went home. But then we got a phone call an hour later from Becky's parents asking us where she was. They knew that she'd been playing with my sister and assumed that she was still with her as she hadn't come home yet. My parents explained that she wasn't with us and she walked home an hour ago. 
My parents asked my sister when she last saw her and she told them that she was walking home. And long story short, there was no sign of her at all. Her parents called around all of her friends and they also said that she wasn't with them and they began to flip out and the police were soon called. The next day, her body was found by a dog walker and she was still on a field behind one of the sand hills. She had been assaulted and strangled. It makes me sick because she was only 11 and she was the sweetest girl ever. It also really bothers me that she never left that field, which means that she was probably murdered close to the time that we were still there as she never got too far. But the worst part, they never found out who murdered her. But my sister says that they just sat and talked for the hour that they were in the field. There was no indication that anything bad was going to happen. No bad vibes, no suspicious conversations, nothing. She said that a man walked across the sand hill by himself for about 10 minutes and he was a potential suspect for the police for a while, but I don't think anything ever came from it. My sister just remembers his clothes, but not his face, as he was quite high up on the hill. But my sister still blames herself and she wishes every day that she could just go back and walk her home. Just thinking about Becky makes me extremely emotional and I'm actually tearing up while I'm writing this out. I just hope that Becky is safe in heaven and her murder will be solved one day. This happened while my parents were away when I was around 14. So a friend of theirs was staying in our house at the time, caring for me while they were gone for what I think was about a two week period or so. The person staying with us, my brother and I, was sleeping in a smallish house thing that we have at the back of our place, per her choice, as we'd had rooms available for her to sleep in the house, so she wasn't able to hear anything or do anything about any situation that might happen in the actual house itself if it were to take place at night. Anyway, I was up late at night on a school night, I think around 11 or 12, on my phone after having read a book for a bit in bed. For context, my room is on the second floor of our place too. We have an alarm in our house and normally I turn it on when I go to bed, but my older brother, about 25 at the time, had messaged me saying that he'd be back soon since he'd been working, so I decided I'd leave it off just to make things easier for him and so he could turn it on himself. While I was on my phone, I heard noises from downstairs, what I thought was banging, but... I just dismissed it as one of my brother's friends, who my brother had mentioned might be coming around at some point, knocking on one of the doors. I stayed on my phone for a few minutes more and then put it to the side and tried to get some sleep. But then I heard more noise downstairs and at that point I was wondering if maybe there was someone breaking into the house, but I just thought, nah, that's pretty unlikely. But I decided to sit up and continue to listen out for a bit just in case. Another noise, and this time louder, and I began to hear movement downstairs. I thought it was probably my older brother, who had just been making a bit more noise than usual because he was having a hard time opening the door with his key or something. But then I heard the downstairs hall door open, and someone began to move throughout the hall and then continued to make their way up the stairs. But my bedroom was right next to the top of the stairs, so I could hear everything clearly as someone ran up. By then I thought... That's not my brother and reached for my phone, ready just in case I needed to call the police. And then the door swung open and a tall man in a black hoodie stood in the doorway, his right side slightly behind the door and made eye contact with me. I was completely frozen because it definitely was not my brother. In fact, I had no idea who this man was. I think he had noticed that my hand was on my phone and, thinking I'd called the police, sprinted downstairs and out of the house, making a lot of noise as he ran. For a moment, I was in shock and had no idea what to do. At first, I was calm, but then I called the woman who was staying with us on my phone and I just broke down crying because I was terrified. She ended up coming into the house and comforting me in my room, sitting with me as she called the police. The police arrived later and I tried to recall the details of the man but when he had opened my door I was freaking out internally so all I could remember was the hoodie colour. I later found out that he had broken in by jimmying open one of the downstairs windows with a crowbar and as soon as I heard that I realised that 
if I hadn't have had my hand on my phone, him thinking that I called the police. Who knows, he may have actually beaten me to death. In seventh grade, I went with a few dozen classmates of mine on a tour of the East Coast. But one of the most greatly anticipated stops was Gettysburg, a town famous for its role in the American Civil War. Our tour guide took us to several battlefield sites. We had just gotten back in the seats of our icily air-conditioned coach bus when several things happened in just quick succession. I suddenly felt really hot. It was as if someone had turned a switch on the temperature. I asked the girl in the seat next to me if she had noticed the heat and she told me that she was as cold as ever. I then felt pressure on my ear and it honestly felt like someone was screaming just inches from me but I couldn't really hear anything. I just felt that vibration and that pressure against my ear and then I smelled something familiar and really unpleasant. Death. When I was 10 years old, my father decided that he wanted to come home to die. After years of visiting him in the hospital and after rounds of chemo, suddenly a large hospital bed took up most of the space in our living room. My sister and I would give him a kiss goodbye before running off to catch the school bus and I'd wonder what that goodbye would mean an hour from now and two hours even. I'm telling you all this not to depress you but because it factors into my Gettysburg experience. You see, after my father died, my mother had the carpets in our house shampooed. And that was when I noticed what had been collecting in our house all those weeks. The smell of death. So when I tell you that I smelled an intense wave of death, I need you to understand that this was so much worse than the living room carpet at home. The air was just thick with it. And as quickly as the sensation had come to me, they just left. The screaming, the heat and the stench were gone and... It may seem odd when I tell you that I still don't believe in ghosts, but perhaps knowing about my living room will help you understand what I mean when I say that I believe that sadness and pain and loss can hang onto walls like residual smoke or something. They stain carpets, they infect the land, and the land at the battle site was screaming under the weight of the dying in the merciless July heat. So I'm a male and this happened when I was about 19 years old. I'm still not sure what to make of it but I'm 26 now and it's really not the initial experience itself that gave me the spooks. It's more about what happened after. So I was in nursing school at this time. One night I woke up at around 3.30 in the morning. My TV was on as usual because I sleep better with it. I was laying on my back and something just felt really off. I glanced to my right and I saw something next to my bed. I saw a black figure, only from the shoulders up, like it was crouched down next to my bed, just watching me sleep. When I saw this, obviously I became anxious and tried to roll over, but I realized that I just couldn't move my body. I couldn't scream and I couldn't do anything but watch it. The figure seemed to be hovering slowly back and forth along the side of my bed. This felt it went on for a lifetime, but it was only a few minutes because I could see my clock below my TV. And eventually, the figure lowered itself below the edge of my bed until I just couldn't see it anymore. And once I lost sight of it, I immediately started getting a tingling sensation just all over my body and I was able to move again. I was so terrified that I just scooted over towards the other side of my bed and stared at my TV until I fell back to sleep. And this is where it gets interesting. So, a few weeks later, one of my classmates, 35 and female, decided to open up to a few of us, stating that she basically was a medium. I have mixed feelings on this, so I wasn't quick to believe her until she started telling another classmate about her dead grandmother. None of us knew she was deceased, and she never told this woman either. And she also described an object that she often sees with her, and... It turned out to be a necklace her grandmother gave her before she died. A few shocking reveals later, I decided to ask her about the thing that I saw next to my bed that night. And before I even got to explain anything, she asked if it was about the little girl. But this was odd because when I was in high school, I was woken up by my cat crying and I saw a little girl standing behind him. 
anyway, I proceeded to explain to her about the situation that happened with the black figure next to my bed. And after I was done, she said, You didn't look over the edge of the bed, did you? I hadn't told her that, but I responded to her question with no, I didn't. She told me that if I ever saw it again, do not follow it, and you need to say the Lord's Prayer. After this, she told me that she had also seen a little boy with me before, and she said that he was no good, and she called him a little demon boy. At this time in my life, me and my friends were exploring old cemeteries, abandoned houses, general creepy places, and she stated that I could have picked him up doing these kinds of activities. This was on a Friday. The following Monday, I jokingly asked her, you didn't see the little boy with me today, did you? And she laughed and said, no, but you've seen him before, right? And this gave me chills. Of course, I asked her where I had seen him. And next, this woman looked into me. And I say that because when she looked into my eyes, she just stared into me like no one has ever done before. And after a few awkward seconds of this, she proceeded to tell me where I had seen him. This woman described the layout of my bedroom to me, told me that I saw him next to my closet. She literally described both the entries to my bedroom and the layout of the room, and then she told me that I saw him next to my closet. I hadn't told her this, but the closet was only about two feet apart from my bed, and that is the side of the bed that I saw the black figure. After explaining that to her, she told me that he disguised himself in front of me that night. And she said that if something presents itself in black to you, it's usually a demonic presence. And yes, that made me even more scared. After this, I cut back on the late night graveyard and abandoned house searches. I haven't seen anything like that since. Though I have had a few other occurrences happen. I've been having these kind of encounters since I was a child. Though most were mild and I didn't feel afraid. But the figure next to my bed... It was the only moment that I truly feared for myself in regards to the paranormal. If I remember correctly, the year was 2011. My dad and sister and I lived in the same house as we do today, which is a three-story house that we took over after my grandmother passed. Me and my sister both had our bedrooms on the highest floor, right by the attic. And the attic was where most of the activity came from at the time. Cliché, I know. We always heard weird noises coming from in there, and even my most skeptical friends told me that they felt just a very unpleasant feeling every time they walked up the stairs to the third floor. And the unpleasant feeling got even stronger if you entered the attic. Now one day, I went into the attic to search for some old stuff that we had stored in there. As I'm looking around in the boxes and bags, I saw someone in the corner of my eye. My sister was slowly approaching me from behind, crouching, and I was sure that she was trying to scare me or something. So I just started talking to her, and she stopped right behind me. I don't remember what I said to her, but I just didn't get a reply. So I said her name, and still no reply, and I said her name louder, and yes, I heard her respond. Although... Not from behind me, but from a bedroom. I was about to have a panic attack, and I still saw the figure in the corner of my eye crouching. I saw long, blonde, dirty hair, but couldn't make out a face quite, and I closed my eyes in fear before opening them again, and as I turned around, there was nobody there. I grabbed the bag that I was supposed to look through, and I just ran like hell straight out of that attic. My eyes feel hot and my throat is dry and I was in my room not even 10 minutes ago just watching some things on YouTube. I hear something move really quickly. I look over to my bookshelf and the cup that I had there moved unrealistically fast about 2 inches backwards. I was at the time very confused as I just thought that it slid or something. But now this part, I will understand if no one believes me as I doubt it even more, trust me. So I got up to use the restroom and I heard two soft knocks and then one hard knock on my windows. No two that the drapes were closed so I couldn't actually see. I mustered up enough courage though and opened the drapes. And there, standing there, was a boy with ginger hair and pitch black eyes. And he quickly dropped away from my window as soon as I saw him. 
It was as if he fell off a ledge or something and just slid down, out of sight. I really don't understand it though, and I'm not sure how to describe it perfectly, but his eyes were a type of dark that a blind man sees, if that makes any sense. It's the best that I can describe it. But just as this kid disappeared, my ears started ringing really harshly, as if a grenade just went off by me. I ran into the living room where I'm now sharing this with you guys, and honestly, I've never believed in the paranormal, but now I kind of feel like I have to. I'm still cooling down right now, and I'm sweating. I have a dry ass throat, and my eyes feel hot and heavy, but I'm going to try and uh, get some sleep now see what happens. In 2002, my husband was deployed out of the country for 15 straight months and I kept our housing unit occupied on a military post in the eastern time zone, halfway between Canada and Mexico with our two children, two cats and my 90 pound bulldog Mastiff Mix. I worked at a large and privately owned wildlife rehab a day or two a week. This charity participated in a bingo charity nearby to raise funds, and it competed with another charity run by two people who claimed to be in witness protection for witnessing a murder up north. But they were sketchy people to say the least. I met two people who were terrified after dealing with them, and they claimed ignorance as to why large dogs and cats disappeared in their care. During the 15-month separation, though, I decided that our oldest was ready to assume the responsibility of caring for the housing unit with the help of our neighbor while I left for a short period of time. He learned how to answer the phone, to lock the doors, how to call our bulldog to the main door should anyone cause any problems, and how to call our neighbor if anything should go amiss or awry or if anyone got hurt or whatnot. And so too did our youngest. With this being so, I asked our neighbor to be on call one night as I drove up to a super Walmart to get some groceries. She agreed and I left in our two-door tracker soft top. The Walmart that I went to was 15 miles away in a slightly larger city than the one nearest. Its main parking lot was really long as the sides had no spots and to its left was a Lowe's. So I parked about 15 spaces away from the store's front. I was much closer to the side road leading to the Lowe's than to the store itself. When I parked, there were a few cars by mine and it was about dusk. When I came out about 25 minutes later, it was fully dark around this time, about 9.15pm, and my car was one of the only cars at the end of the parking lot. There was one car by mine though, and it was a van. It was one of those windowless utility vans, like from the 70s, or at least the design has never been updated. It was a dull white, and the weird thing about the van was that it was parked ahead of my car lest I would never have seen my car at all. You see, two door trackers are short. Even in a regularly parked manner, they're not visible from the bottom of a parking aisle, as most all other cars are longer than it. The van was the only car parked by mine at all, and it was parked almost in between the space next to mine and the space in front of itself. As I approached the back of my tracker, I was going to put the groceries in the back, I saw that the van was parked in such a way so that its sliding side door on the right side was adjacent to my driver's side door. It was also parked rather closely so that if I opened my driver's side door and someone slid open the van's side door, there's no way that I could run forward in between the two. And this definitely gave me the willies. I remember very well putting plastic bags of Walmart crap into the back of the car and wondering just why someone would park like that. I mean, why? Here's the thing about stuff like this too. When a female or a young person or whatever sees something this freaky in real life, she might not get it at first. Unless she grew up in like Detroit or the west side of Cleveland, danger signs blink a little slower. And worse, we're told by our family that we're just imagining things when we report that we were scared about something. I had given birth to a child in a foreign country, ran cross country in a place where boar hogs roamed and taken care of many situations with crazy neighbors without a man before, hence the big dog. But I still stood there at the back of the tracker, trying to figure out why I was so unsettled. I think that we just don't think that the worst can happen, which is why when or if it does, we might just freeze. It never occurs to us that we might really be in trouble. All this being so, I decide to listen to the idiot voice in my head and I close the back of the tracker and I walk over to the passenger side of the car. 
I unlocked it, tossed my purse into the back, and crawled over the stick shift as fast as I could, closing the door quickly behind me and hitting the lock. I then shoved the key into the ignition while slamming down the emergency brake, put the car into first and gave it gas. I pulled away from the van, turned right and sped away to the lowest portion of the parking lot, all without putting on my seatbelt or turning on the lights. But by the time I pulled another right around to face the same direction, the van was still there. I put on my seatbelt and as I began to adjust myself, the van left. I drove home carefully and when I got home the kids were fine and our dog was happy and the neighbor said nothing amiss happened. And this might be the end of the story you're thinking but it definitely isn't. A few weeks later I had to go to Walmart again and the neighbor said that she also needed a thing or two so I told her that we could barter. I bought her two things and she kept an eye on my children. Again I parked near the end of the parking lot. This time however I took our other car, a four-door, hardtop, five-speed tracker. We liked the cars, sue me. I shopped quickly and upon leaving the store and walking toward our car with the cart, I stopped dead in my tracks about ten parking spaces out because a windowless, white utility van was parked near our car but parked slightly forward again. I must have stood there for about twenty seconds trying to gather what was happening. I take this time to redress the concept of reality. I mean, what the hell is really happening? I can only remember certain things about that moment, and I know I turned my cart around. I know that I felt numb. I know that I felt like I was floating, not walking, and that I was floating too slowly to get back to the store for my liking. I remember that my teeth thudded in my head with every footstep, even though I was floating. And when I did get to the building, I walked up to the tallest person in a blue vest and cheerfully asked if he could walk me to my car. And I did not say, someone is trying to abduct me. In fact, I seem to remember thinking that that would discredit me. It all happened very quickly, so instead I asked nicely if I could have an escort to my car. He nudged his chin up in another person's direction and walked with me towards the doors. When we got outside, though... The white van was miraculously just gone. I figured it would be, but I must admit that it made me wonder if I imagined it. Anywho, I told him that I would really just appreciate if he watched me load the groceries and drive away. He was very nice, and he did just that. As I drove home, I watched for trailing cars, and there were none. Anyway, by then, 911 had occurred, sadly, and it was hard to get on the post without an ID. I called the police that night and told them about both incidences, and I uh, didn't file a report, but I left my phone number and said that I would come in if anyone else experienced a white van issue. As I thought, I was not taken seriously. I take responsibility for not calling the police the first time, and after that I stopped working for the charity a while later. Up until my mid-twenties, I would have told you that there's no such thing as ghosts. Most things people say, I think it's just their imagination or wishful thinking. But nowadays, I don't know. I just, uh, I don't know. So when I was in my twenties and newly married, my spouse and I moved for his job. We needed to find a place to live in pretty quickly, and fate would have it that we lucked into the perfect house. It was old, and in its previous life, it had been someone's beach cottage, which I actually loved. What's better than living in a resort town, close enough to walk to the beach, right? Plus, it wasn't in a resort area, it was on the back half of someone's property, with one road in and out, and lots of trees and shade, very quiet, no other people around. It was basically just one big room with a small addition to one side that contained a kitchen and a bath, and another addition off the back that had a bedroom. And the big room was awesome. All windows on three sides with a nice breeze most of the time. A fireplace and lots of open area. And the only thing that really pinged my radar was the landlord. When we rented, he was just overly insistent that we sign a year lease and we couldn't break it for any reason. No matter what, we needed to pay out the lease whether we lived in the house or not. I thought that that was a little weird the way he kept repeating that over and over because he wanted to make absolutely sure that we understood. But it just didn't really register 
at the time, other than I was a bit worried that maybe there were troublemakers or noisy parties in the beach or something. He assured us, though, that it was a very quiet neighborhood, but he repeated again that we couldn't break the lease. I worked a 9-to-5 job at the time. My spouse worked 12-hour on and off shifts, so there were lots of times when I would be home by myself. The first month or two were fine. I liked the house and I liked the neighborhood. I really liked the beach. I'm honestly a homebody, so when the spouse was at work, I would stay at home reading or watching a little TV or cooking and whatnot. I'd always wanted to learn how to knit anyway, so I bought some yarn and started teaching myself. But then, sometime around the third month, I just started getting a really strong feeling like someone would be standing behind me while I was reading. You know, like looking over your shoulder type thing. It only happened when I was alone in the house and only when I was in the main room. Without thinking too much about it though, I started sitting in places where my back was to the wall or reading in the bedroom. When I went to bed at night, I started closing the door between the bedroom and the rest of the house because I felt safe in the bedroom. Sometimes though, when I fell asleep in front of the TV late at night, I'd wake up to catch someone standing in front of the fireplace just out of the corner of my eye. I thought that I needed to stop dreaming so much, but I started to stay in the bedroom after dark with the door shut after this. And things started not being where I put them in the big room. I got kind of irritated with my spouse for messing with my stuff. I wasted 5-10 to 10 minutes almost every day looking for my handbag or my car keys. And then, one day when I came home after work, I found my knitting yarn wrapped and tangled around all the furniture in the big room. And I don't mean just a little bit. I mean the yarn was strung between couches and wrapped around the legs of the chairs. I told myself that my spouse was playing a trick on me and I just cleaned it up. Then I decided that I wouldn't mention it to him just to see how long it took for him to come clean. He never did, by the way, and I just moved my knitting to the bedroom. My sister came to visit for a long weekend at one point. I gushed so much about our lovely beach house that she came to visit and see the beach. She came for a four-day weekend. She slept on the pull-out sofa in the big room, and after the first night, she told us that the sofa wasn't very comfortable and she thought that she was coming down with something so she changed her travel arrangements and she was leaving that afternoon. She seemed agitated too but she just wouldn't talk about it. A few days after she went home she called me. She started the conversation with I know you don't believe in ghosts and maybe I'm just being stupid and honestly my heart just dropped. I thought I was the only one and I was just being so stoic and pretending that I never saw or heard anything. She went on to tell me that after she went to sleep that night in the big room, noises woke her up in the middle of the night. She thought it was one of us, but no one was there. Then, while she was sitting in the bed looking around, the windows just started opening and closing by themselves. It just kind of went around the room and one window opened and closed and then the next one to that and then the next one and the next one and she heard footsteps walking straight towards her but nobody was there. The footsteps walked right up to the bed where she was sitting then over the bed continued across the room and then through the side door into the kitchen area. She said that she ran out of the front door and spent the rest of the night on the front porch. She came back inside when the sun came up, waited for us to wake up and made excuses to go home. And obviously, she didn't want to spend another night in that house. She then said to me, Look, I know you don't want to believe me. and You know what, that's okay, but I'm never sleeping in that house again. I told myself that my sister had always been a little nutty about stuff like that, so knowing that the house was old, she probably just had a very vivid dream. I kept telling myself that, but a few weeks after, just when I'd stopped jumping at every stray noise... I woke up one Sunday morning and went to cook a leisurely breakfast for me and my spouse. And I still don't know how to explain this, but I opened the kitchen cabinets to get the dishes out to start cooking. And all the dishes were rearranged. And not messy, mind you. Not tumbled out. They were just all really neat and orderly, but everything was on the wrong shelf. The shelf that normally had glasses now had plates stacked on them and the shelves that normally had bowls now had glasses on them. And my first thought, honestly, was that somebody had been in the house during the night. I checked all the locks, still locked. 
We didn't know many people and I couldn't think of anyone who would pull a trick like that. And besides, there was so much stuff moved that no one could do it quietly without disturbing people sleeping in directly the next room. And so I did what any half-crazed, scared-to-crap person would do. I pretended like it just never happened. I pretended that I always kept the glasses on that shelf and there was nothing strange about having all the plates on this shelf. I sure as hell wasn't moving anything back because I didn't want to see what would happen if I did. I cooked breakfast though and I went on with my day and later that afternoon I told my spouse that I wasn't really comfortable in this house anymore and could we find somewhere else to live. Amazingly enough, my spouse never asked me why. He simply said that that was probably a good idea and let's find something quick. And we moved out. We called the landlord after we'd already packed and moved the furniture. He came over and picked up the keys and he never, not once, asked why we were moving. In fact, he never met our eyes and just kept looking at the ground. We agreed to keep paying the rent until he could find some new tenants. Months later, I actually asked my spouse if he ever felt anything strange in that house, and he said, Yeah, actually, that wasn't a good house, and I'm glad we moved. And we never talked about it again. So this happened a long time ago when I was just a kid. I was home alone one hot summer evening. My parents were out on business and I was enjoying the time alone to do whatever I wanted. We lived in a two-bedroom first-floor apartment at the time. From the front entrance was a hall that opened into the kitchen. To the left at the far end of the kitchen was my room and to the right of the kitchen was the living room which connected to a small den. My parents' bedroom was also connected to the living room off to the right. It was around 9pm when I'd finished dinner and began my nightly routine of taking out the trash, brushing my teeth, and just shutting down for the night. Before retreating into my room, I opened all the windows in the kitchen and living room so that the house would cool down over the night. The windows were all barred, so I wasn't too worried about any funny business happening. I'm a little bit of a security freak, so all the doors in the house have locks, including my bedroom and the bathroom. I eventually shut off all the lights and I went to my room to watch some TV. I would say that at around midnight, I think I dozed off. I had a really weird dream too, or rather a nightmare, of someone knocking on my door with the knocking getting progressively louder. And it was odd because in the dream, I was laying in my bed, but I just couldn't move. The knocking got so blaringly loud until I just couldn't stand it, and then I heard a scream and I woke up. My heart was racing and I was sweating a little, but there was no damage done. I looked around my room and glanced at my alarm, which read 4am. Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, I brushed the dream off and I laid back down. I closed my eyes and then suddenly heard knocking on my actual bedroom door. A little delirious, I thought that I'd slipped back into my nightmare, but my eyes shot wide open and I sat up and stared at my door trying to listen. And then there were three slow knocks that followed. My first thought was that my parents were back early with food or something and they wanted me to have some. My dad was notorious for knocking on my door when he got home late at night to check on me, sometimes without calling my name first as well. I always told him that it spooked me and he should announce himself when he knocks but he always forgets. So I got up and began walking towards the door but something just felt wrong. When my parents come home there's usually commotion. They might be having a conversation, or I can hear their keys jingling, my mum's heels, footsteps, or something. This time, though, it was just dead silent. I stopped halfway to the door, and I called out, Uh, who is it? There was no answer. I opened my mouth to call out again, but before I could get the first word out, there were several rapid knocks on the door. Very persistent knocks as if it was an emergency and whoever was on the other side needed to get in now. I felt a lump in my throat and my mind was racing and the first thing I thought of was that it must have been my dad on the other side and he's in trouble. What if he's choking and can't speak? What if he needs my help? I was frozen in place and couldn't move and I said, Who is it? Once more. And again, nothing. Please say something. Please tell me who it is. It's not funny, I said. A few moments of silence went by, when suddenly 
It was as if someone threw their whole weight into the door. Rapid, loud bangs began attacking the door, kicks and punches. It was as if there were three people on the other side trying to bang the door down. It was so loud that I just started crying and I found myself jumping backwards and crawling to the corner of my room. The violent banging went on for a few more moments and then just silence. I sat in the corner frozen. My hands were covering my mouth and tears were rolling down my cheeks. I thought that this was the end. I was shocked the door still stood because when I heard the first bang, I thought the frame would come crashing down and whatever was on the other side would instantly enter and just end me. I sat there for a period of time that felt like an eternity, and suddenly I heard a clinking, the sound of metal brushing into each other. I knew whatever was on the other side was going through the silverware drawer, and if my life didn't end already, this was my last chance because I wouldn't get another one. So I sprang up and climbed onto my dresser sitting against my window. I threw open the curtain and shoved the window down, climbed out as quietly as I could. I fell to the sidewalk and ran to the police station down the road. I was hysterical and I told them what had occurred. That night, my parents were called and they did an investigation of the house. The only things out of place were a cigarette butt left at the base of my bedroom door and my butter knife on the kitchen table. In the following months, we moved out of that apartment and thankfully, I can say that that was the most excitement that I'd ever been through. I soon went to college and graduated, moved to a new state with my family nearby, and life is thankfully continuing as normal. So I'm an insomniac and two weeks ago I felt like I wasn't going to be able to sleep so I decided to go and take a walk to relax a bit. It was around 12.30. Considering that I'm 6'2 and a 250 pound man in decent shape, I never felt scared to walk at night, thinking that people would be more scared to see me than the opposite. But around 10 minutes into my walk, I just got a chill in my spine. Something just wasn't right and I glanced around me and noticed someone on the other side of the street wearing a hoodie and walking. I tried to shake it off, telling myself that it's just another insomniac maybe, but the chill just wouldn't go away. Something was definitely off about this guy. I started walking faster at this point and decided that I would cut my walk short and just go back home, but the guy kept the pace and he even started to walk faster than me. At that point, I was sweating like crazy, but I went faster. Two minutes had passed and I turned my head again to get a better look at the guy. That's when I noticed that somebody else was catching up on my side of the road, also wearing a hoodie. My brain went into panic mode and I started running as fast as I could. Soon after, I heard their footsteps catching up and at that point, I was near my house so I knew the layout by heart. I jumped over a bike rack and went down into the dirt trail that went into a small forest near my house. I know, looking back, the forest was definitely not the safest choice. I knew that they were still following me but were not right on my tail since there was a delay before they hit the dirt path. My lungs were just on fire but I didn't care. I diverged from the main path and I went into the forest, running through the trees in a smaller path that led to one of the neighbor's backyards. I ran up on the other side of my street to my house and turned the corner and went through the bushes around my house and entered using my back door. With my whole body on fire by that point, I peeked through my window and saw them just run past my house. I was safe, but I saw something that made my body turn from burning to freezing in a split second. Both of them had knives in their hands. And I mean big knives. I don't know if it was because of the running or because of the fear. Probably both, but eventually I threw up. I was lucky that night. I know. About four years ago, I worked as a laundress. I worked 5am to 5pm and would often work alone. We usually have a security guard posted near the parking lot. They carry a radio and pepper spray and later in the day they patrol the building. A new guy had started though and I never saw him watching over the parking lot when I came in each morning. Throughout my shift he would come into my laundry room. He was talkative but I noticed that he would look at my body a lot when he thought I wouldn't notice. One day I came into work and started putting my stuff away, getting ready to begin. I hadn't turned on all the lights yet so there were parts of the room I couldn't see. 
when suddenly I hear radio static in the corner of the room and I see a red radio light. I turn on the lights and the new guy is in the corner of the room, just hiding and watching me. When I asked what he was doing there, he said that he was just hanging out and started laughing. It was obvious that he was waiting for me. He ended up doing this so often too that I ended up just getting used to it. But I came in early one day and was working in one of our smaller areas. He came into the smaller room to talk to me. He's a big guy so I couldn't get around him. He was just talking to me but I couldn't move or leave the room because he blocked the door. He asked me why I came in early that day and I told him it was because I had to leave early later and he told me that I was required to tell him all my hours so that he always knew where I was. He was leaning over me, he was very tall and I honestly felt like he was about to try and upset me. I had this horrible feeling in my stomach too that he was about to try something so I pushed past him and called my supervisor who said that he would keep an eye on him. I told him that I just had a bad gut feeling about this guy and that I needed to leave for the day. And the next day, he was fired. And apparently, he wasn't in the guard tower at the start of his shift because he would spend the mornings in the woods near the parking area recording girls walking in there for their shifts each morning. They also found a huge collection of pop soda cans, coffee cups in his locker that he admitted he dug out from the various trash bins around where I and the other girls worked. And his wife shortly left him after that and took full custody of their newborn baby. For those unfamiliar with Grindr, it's a gay dating app that shows guys nearby. It makes you use your location while using the app, but it doesn't give you your exact location unless you send it to the person directly. Anyways, I got a message from a blank profile one day. No name, no pic, and no bio. The only thing that popped up was how close he was, less than a mile. This happens a lot because, well, there's lots of closeted guys out there, especially back then. Being an overweight guy in the gay community, I had to take anything that I could get because most gay guys in my community wouldn't even give me the time of day. He started off nice though, introduced himself as Jesus and asked how I was doing and all that sort of small talk. And yes, Jesus is a bit of a common name in some cultures. He told me that he was into chubbier guys though and after exchanging pics, we both agreed that we found the other one attractive. He asked me if I would like to come over to play video games and maybe have some fun. I'd only met a couple of guys off of Grinder at this point and although we had some good times, it ultimately just didn't pan out. However, I'd always met them somewhere public first so I'd never met anyone at their place or anyone come over to mine. I figured though that it had been long enough and some casual fun might be nice. Plus, he was really cute and actually my type. He agrees to come and pick me up since I'm only a few blocks away. Apparently he lived in the nearby trailer park. I decided that I'd like to shower first and he says he'll head over. And then he says that he's really embarrassed to ask but wonders if I'd be willing to lend him $20. Supposedly he lived with his mom and she had left for the weekend without any food or money for him or something. I know that it was really stupid in hindsight but I honestly felt really bad for him. I tell him that I actually don't have any cash, but he says that that's okay. I can just send him some money through an app. I don't remember what it was called, but it was something like Venmo. I go ahead and send it though and take my shower and then let him know that I'm ready. He says that he's heading out, but he can't find his keys. I say it's okay and I'll just wait outside for him. I hadn't given him my address yet, but I was almost ready to. However, when I asked if he had found them, he just never responded. Minutes went by and then an hour and I messaged him again to ask if he was still coming and I could see him going on and offline, so I know that he read my messages. I finally just accepted that he was ghosting me and probably just wanted money. So I messaged him one last time and just told him that that was pretty messed up as well as explaining that had he just asked, I would have given him money without having to go through all of that. But what can I say? I can be a softy sometimes. Fast forward a couple of weeks and I never heard back from him, so I just blocked him. 
I get another message from someone on Grinder relatively close to me, and his profile is also blank, which definitely raises my suspicions. He tells me that he's also into chubby guys, which really makes me suspicious because it's highly unlikely two chubby chasers live so close to me. We trade pics again, and it's a different guy, but he suddenly asks for money again. In Grinder, you can create as many accounts as you'd like. All you need is an email address. But there were tons of spam accounts on there that are automated. It was a real pain. But anyway, I called him out because I was like 95% sure that it was Jesus. At first he acts like he doesn't know what I'm talking about, calls me crazy and then blocks me. I felt a little bit bad because I thought maybe I'd made a mistake and just chased off a guy for nothing. But then again, his sudden offensive reaction definitely made me have my doubts. Weeks go by though, and every so often this same guy tries to fool me, even though I don't fall for it. Eventually, I blow up on him and ask him what the hell his problem is. We start going at it, and eventually he says, you wouldn't say this stuff to my face. I tell him that I would gladly tell him to get lost in person, not that I expected him to actually show up this time, and he responded with, alright, we'll see about that. Be there soon. Now, I was a little worried at this point because it crossed my mind that he may not actually be gay and might be some sort of homophobe looking to bash some gay guys. My mind, for some reason, always goes back to those men who have been murdered after meeting up with someone on Grinder. However, I realized that I never gave him my address, so I should be fine. So I say, nice try, but I never gave you my address. He says, yes you did, stupid. You just didn't know it was me be ready, I'm on my way. At this point, my anxiety starts setting off because I did give my address to a guy who had a cancel last minute, but I didn't think anything of it because it was way before Jesus had messaged me a second time. I try to think about what to do, so I try to decide and document his threats. I say, I know that I didn't give you my address, and besides, what do you want to do with me anyway? And he says, you'll see, I've got something for you. Now, the trailer park is always having police go by there, and my neighborhood is separated from theirs by a bayou. At night, I always heard gunshots out there, so I began to panic a bit. I mean, what if he had a gun, or what if he brought friends with him? I say, oh yeah, then what's that? He says, something that'll shut you up. I'm outside. I started freaking out because... I honestly couldn't tell if he was just trying to mess with me or if he really was outside. I'd been screenshotting everything and sent it to the grinder admins to report him for credible threats of violence. I wasn't sure if I could call the cops or not because if he was lying, I didn't want to look stupid. Plus, I wasn't sure if it was even enough for them to do anything anyway. I decided to peek outside from the upstairs window and see if I could spot him. If I could get the make and model of his car, then maybe I could at least have something to give the cops, if need be. I live in the middle of a cul-de-sac, so when I look out the window, I can see all the way to the end of the street, and when I looked out, I saw a car that I had never seen before parked on the side of the road at the end. My heart was pounding because somehow I just knew that it was him, but a part of me was hoping that it wasn't. I decided that I'd test him and see if he really was out there, and I said, Well, I'm waiting. And he said, I'm outside already. Where are you? Of course, I wasn't, but if that was him and he did know my address, then why wouldn't he just park outside of my house? And sure enough, I was right. He says, Yeah, I see you. You're going to get it now. And then I say, Then give it to me. I'm right here. And he says, just you wait. I knew that he couldn't see me from his car because I was peeking out discreetly and our windows have a privacy shade on them where people only see a black screen from the outside. A few more minutes go by and eventually the car just takes off. I have a feeling that he used Grinder to triangulate the area of where my neighborhood was, but of course he just couldn't find my exact house because it hadn't been him who I'd given my address to. Grinder later sent me a message saying that he'd been banned from the app and they contacted the local authorities. I never heard anything else after that, so I don't really know what became of it. The cops never contacted me too if they did pay him a visit. 
and I just never heard from him again. These days, I'm actually married, so I don't use Grinder anymore, thankfully. But still, it took a while before I was able to sleep soundly after that. I rarely left the house too, and when I did, I always made sure that his car just wasn't around anywhere. In hindsight, he was probably just a stupid kid that just wanted to troll people. But then again, maybe not. These stories were told to me by my stepmom, and she's okay with me retelling them to you guys. All of these stories take place over 20 years ago, and she hasn't had anything like what she shared with me since. Other than the haunting that I personally experienced, that is, but that's a different story altogether. So, back when my stepmom was a little girl, around 8 years old, she lived in Mexico with her parents and 5 other siblings. My stepmom is the eldest, and because of that, she shared a room with the babies of her family. But one night she explained how she was woken just kind of randomly and saw these two little kids holding hands and standing right next to her bed. She said that they were see-through and that they just stared at her, unmoving. She was terrified but didn't make a noise as to not wake her siblings, and instead just remained frozen in place. After a while she blinked and they just vanished as if he weren't there at all. She went back to sleep brushing it off as just some sort of a dream or something and in the morning she didn't say a word to her parents. Over the course of a few weeks she started seeing glimpses of the two kids throughout her house but it was always out of the corner of her eye. On one morning she was in the kitchen helping her siblings get some breakfast when she looked up and she saw the kids right by her youngest baby brother. She immediately grabbed what was closest to her, a wooden spoon, and launched herself at the kids, shouting at them to leave her brother alone. They disappeared, and her siblings were all confused, as none of them had seen it. She told them that it was alright, though, and then just continued on with her day. Eventually, she said that she started to see them almost every night. She'd awake from dreams that she couldn't remember, and would see them just staring down at her, their faces void of any emotion, but always holding hands for some reason. She tried telling them to go away and leave her family alone and they disappear only to come back at night. Eventually one day she saw them actually move and reach a hand out towards her mother. She screamed at them to not touch her mum and they snapped their heads to look at my stepmom. She stood her ground and told them to leave her alone and they vanished again. Her mother quickly started asking her what the problem was and she explained what she had been seeing. Her mother instantly freaked out and told her father what had happened. As soon as he heard, they took my stepmom out of the house and to her aunt's place. He didn't say anything but that they'd bring her siblings with them and that they'd be staying with her aunt for a bit. My stepmom later learned that when her mother was pregnant with her that she had seen the same kids and they had tried to touch her stomach where my stepmom was still unborn. After her mother gave birth to my stepmom, she stopped seeing them, so when my stepmom told her mother how she had been seeing those kids, she really freaked out. In fact, they ended up calling for a priest and eventually just moved out of that house. A couple of years later, they moved to the United States and everything was fine. My stepmom explained how she remembered occasionally seeing people wandering around looking lost, but that she could see through them. She ignored it and after a few years she just stopped seeing them. Fast forward quite a few years to when my stepmom was single and had three kids, all very young, babies and toddlers. She lived two houses down from her parents' house where some of her brothers were currently staying. During the time that she was living there she always felt like someone was watching her and she just felt this really angry atmosphere around her is what she said to me. She explained it like trying to relax but kind of getting stuck and being tense. And she didn't live in that house long, and here's why. On the last night that she slept there, she woke up to something or someone pushing down on her chest. She kept trying to get up or throw her arms at whatever was pushing her down, but her hands just kept hitting air. She struggled for a few minutes, just feeling this weight on her, continuously pushing until she suddenly was able to throw herself upright. She immediately got out of bed and grabbed her kids and ran down to her parents' house. She frantically knocked on the door until her brothers opened it up and let her in. They were worried and asked what was wrong. They had never seen my stepmom so scared before. She's the kind of person who will not hesitate to fight someone to protect people and doesn't take crap from anybody. 
She also raised her siblings, so they've always seen her as a very strong person. She explained what happened and told them that she refused to go back in that house. Her brothers led her to sit down and she made sure that her kids were all right and that's when one of her brothers noticed that she had this huge bruise on her chest. She went to the bathroom to look in the mirror and sure enough, there was this really large bruise that looked like misshapen hands almost. And needless to say, she spent the night there with her kids and in the morning, she explained to her parents what had happened. She still refused to go back to that house and her brothers ended up moving everything out of the house for her. She moved somewhere else and to this day, she still hasn't set foot anywhere near that house and refuses to get even close to it. She has no idea who the owners and if any of them had any sort of experience like she did there. She just blatantly refuses to have anything to do with that house. She told the story to my dad once and he tried to say it was sleep paralysis but she vividly remembers being able to move around, just unable to get up and she had multiple witnesses to the bruises that she got from it as well. She won't talk much about it but swears that something evil is definitely living in that house. I currently work in a hospital where I take blood from patients. I always thought that I'd experience more paranormal activity than I do, but I just put it down to the fact that, well, I'm in the lab and I don't really go anywhere near the morgue, etc. So lately, I've been working the most in a hospital or seniors home deal. There are two wings that project from the cottage hospital, one for seniors who are in their right minds but simply can't take care of themselves and one for people with dementia and Alzheimer's and all that. Now, the way the blood collection lab is set up, when you're in the lab itself, you walk through a doorway to go into the blood collection area and directly to your left is the doorway to the small waiting area. Now on this one day, the lab tech or the co-worker is at an x-ray and so I'm on my own and as I walk from the lab to the blood collection area, I see out of the corner of my eye an elderly man just sitting in a chair. I notice that there are no labels that have been printed, so I turn to ask him if he's waiting for blood work or for an x-ray or something, and when I do, there's just nobody there. I laugh it off, assuming that it's just my imagination. I will always take the more common, normal answer over anything else, and I just get on with my day. Except, two more times, all about five minutes apart as well, the same thing happens. In one sighting, he's still sitting. In another, he's standing looking at the door, and each time it's just a glimpse out of the corner of my eye until I look directly at him, and there's nothing there. I'm still assuming that there's nothing odd about this. My mind just must be playing tricks on me until my co worker comes back from the x ray, and she's passing the door, stops and spins around, and then starts laughing. Hey, uh, I was completely sure that I just saw some old guy standing in the doorway. I told her that I had seen the same thing three times and we were both kind of creeped out at this point. To be honest, I was a little more upset that maybe he was trying to communicate and we couldn't hear him or see him except for those quick flashes. Later that day, we also learned that one of our casual customers from the home had actually died that night in his sleep. When I was 15, I moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma with my sister and my mum to live with an uncle that I had never met before. As horrible as he was too, he is not the main focus in this story. So my uncle would pick up random men around the city and pay them to work for him. He owned his own tree trimming business and he honestly treated them all horribly. This one guy he hired though, I won't state his name here, eventually moved in and started regularly working for my uncle. Let's call him S. He was a major alcoholic, but he seemed like uh, an all-around nice kind of helpful guy. He would always offer to help with things that I or my mum were working on. I remember a time that he bought cookie dough only for me to end up eating it, and when he asked what happened to it, I admitted, and he responded, I don't blame you, it's delicious. That's what it's meant for. Soon after moving in, he came in drunk to have a conversation with my mum in our living room. She obliged. Again, he came across as a very open-hearted, kind person, so it was really a pleasure speaking with him. A while into the conversation, and 
he slips in something pretty unnerving. He tells her that if there's anyone around who's harmed her or is making her life hell, that he would take care of them. My sister recently rekindled an old flame and he ended up moving out here to stay with us and whatnot. Immediately upon his arrival, issues occurred between my uncle and him. But nothing too big, just mainly arguments. Now let's call her boyfriend M. So right before M moved out there to live with us, he was depending on a huge settlement from a work accident. And well, he got it and he kept it all in cash. Over the past couple of weeks upon his arrival, my sister and him quickly faded out of love. My uncle proposed a job offer to S about an apartment downtown. My uncle was also a carpenter, houses, apartments, etc. The job proposal was that S move into this apartment to live while he worked on it so my uncle didn't have to. Again, he picks up guys to work for him so he can give them crap pay because he's an all-round asshat. S happily accepts the offer though. I'm sure because not only is he getting paid, but he gets to live apart from his abusive jerk of a boss, which was good for him. After my sister and M lose interest in each other, he inquires about moving with S into this new apartment to live and help work. They ended up moving in there and M's settlement money came within the month after his move into the apartment with S. So we ended up moving into our house a few minutes away and my sister lost contact with him. One night, my sister, mum and I are all sitting in the living room and my mum's phone rings, breaking the late night silence. It's my uncle and only a few seconds into the phone call does her face contort into that kind of disbelief and horror look. I come and sit on the rug in front of her, inquisitively. I can tell by looking at her and I can tell by the cold shift in the atmosphere that something was horribly wrong. She was looking around the house fretfully in response to our caller. Okay, just calm down. Tell me exactly what happened. And what happened? Well, my uncle went over to M and S's apartment. It's around 11pm, I believe. When he arrives, he notices that the door is slightly ajar. That's obviously a little bit unnerving, so he pushes the door open and the apartment is pitch black. He brings out his flashlight, and there's someone on the couch, but they aren't in any relatively normal position. They're kind of slumped over the arm, the head on the seat, and my uncle walks closer, calling out for M and S, and the closer he walks, the more the details magnify surreally. There is blood and brain matter all over the man and the couch. He had been brutally bludgeoned to death. When my uncle runs out of the apartment in terror. He calls the police. He calls my mum. My sister begins to cry as my uncle is identifying. Yes, I think it is M. It aired on the news soon after that, but they didn't give an identity. By the description of the physical characteristics, it was clearly her recent ex-boyfriend, M. And so, where was S and where was all of M's settlement money? Well, nobody ever saw or heard from him again until three years later when he was captured and sentenced to jail. And that's the story of the time that I lived with the murderer. So at the time of this story, my grandmother had unfortunately passed away and was no longer around to bless the home. My mum and I had moved out prior to my grandma's passing for various reasons and my uncle who was still in his teens took over the room. We had to move back in during the time my grandma was sick to help out and just stayed afterwards for a year or so, but in the room across from my uncle. My uncle and I had a relationship like brother and sister, so he would constantly pick on me and pull pranks on me, as did I. He would specifically ask me, though, to not go into his room and mess with his things, which I took as a bit of a challenge. My grandma had passed at this point, and he started experiencing a lot of things in the room himself. His dog would stay in the room with him, although it took tons of coaxing for her to even enter, and even then she would just bark all night. I was still too young for anyone to really be explaining any of these things to me. However, I now see why my uncle was more irritable and anxious during this time. So on this particular day, he asked me not to be in his room, and I was feeling extremely ballsy and entered it anyways. I ran to the very end of the room and started playing with his Pokemon collection when he found me and got mad and basically was like, fine, if you like being in here so much, then stay, and turned off the light and shut the door real quick. 
I got nervous because the room was huge to me and it was pitch dark with the smallest bit of light coming from the crack underneath the door. I ran as fast as I could to open the door but it just wouldn't open and I assumed that my uncle was holding it shut so I began to plead with him to open it. He laughed and told me no. I began to cry and that's when I heard footsteps. I turned my back to the door to face the dark room and kept hearing something running around me. I was so scared in that moment because I couldn't see in front of me but knew something was just terribly wrong. And then I heard it run up the wall too. I strained my eyes to look into the dark and I could see an outline of a person or thing on the corner of the wall and it turned to face me. It seemed to choose a significant spot so that I could see it and it just had a, a white face with the blackest eyes and mouth that I'd ever seen. It smiled at me and then jumped down. My fight or flight kicked in at that moment as I could hear it running towards me and I could hear it breathing heavy and just knew that it was on a mission. I began screaming and kicking at the door. My uncle through this ordeal was trying to open the door but couldn't. I could hear my grandpa scolding him for locking me in and was trying to open it as well but struggled. And finally the door opened at just the last moment and I ran out of that room and into my backyard and cried my eyes out. I explained to my grandpa what I saw and he was obviously very skeptical and assumed my uncle scared me into believing such a thing was true. This actually tended to be an issue with him, being skeptical and all that, but I would say majority rules, right? The whole ordeal probably lasted 10 minutes, but it honestly felt like a lifetime to me. It has created a phobia for me too to be in a dark room for too long ever since. My garage actually accidentally locked me out one day and I was stuck in the dark and it caused me to have an anxiety attack. I still remember the whole thing just so vividly too and it was very impactful. I never wanted to be in that room again after that and I avoided it at all costs. We eventually moved out of the home and it was such a relief but that thing still haunts me in my thoughts and nightmares sometimes. I often wonder what would have happened had I been there even a minute longer. I wish that I could rationalize it so bad, but the fear it instilled in me was very real and very traumatizing too. I honestly wish it on nobody else. We did have more paranormal encounters after that, but this one was very personal to me and definitely one of the creepiest. When I was really, really young, I lived in my grandparents' home with my mum. She was still fairly young herself, and my grandma would actually babysit me while my mum worked. My grandma also had quite a history with the paranormal, and I would even consider her a kind of medium of sorts. She didn't cope with it well and had an alcohol addiction to soothe the noise. It ultimately took her life too, and it was a huge loss for me since I was pretty close to her. However, I'm getting sidetracked, so let's stick to the main story. So, with my grandma's abilities, it's pretty safe to say that the afterlife and all things death would kind of gravitate towards her. And there were a lot of things that were allegedly seen by her, and some were straight up evil. I have no real knowledge whether this thing was actually with her prior to my grandparents moving in, or if it was something attached to my grandma, but whatever it was, it was not good. So one day, my mum and I were in our room that we shared, and it was around Christmas time. We left the TV on as a comfort for my mum, and she experienced a lot of things in this room that made her pretty fearful. I had no knowledge of this since I was four or five, and my mum wouldn't tell me these things for obvious reasons. So anyway, we would just leave it on. I remember waking up from my sleep, though, and looking at the TV and seeing that Mr. Pac-Man was on. I don't know if anyone else remembers that being a show, but I do, and I kept hearing creaking and noticed that that door was open. I didn't think too much of it and just walked into the hallway where the creaking was much louder. I stepped facing our living room and then I saw a shadow man pacing back and forth in the living room in front of our tree. I wasn't threatened by it in the slightest and just kind of sat down on the floor to watch. I honestly thought in my heart that I was just witnessing Santa Claus and just fell into a trance state and just kind of watched on as this thing paced. But then it just stopped and faded away and my mum came over and asked what I was doing and I said that I saw Santa. 
My mom was actually more annoyed and tired that I was out of bed, so she really paid no attention to what I had said and then just took me back to bed. Now, years later, I actually told her the story and she was pretty shocked and relayed all of her experiences to me as well. Some were very terrifying, which I believe too, since I myself have witnessed the type of things she described and it's given me a phobia of the dark too. I believe the activity got worse with my grandma's passing because she was no longer there to bless the home and I often wonder if it was a dream, but every time I think of it, I become super uncomfortable and it becomes hard to justify that. So my husband and I were coming back from the grocery store one day. My mum currently lives with me along with my two siblings and on this particular day I had her watching my daughter while I went shopping and on our way back home as we were entering our neighbourhood I saw my mum's car coming towards us. I asked my husband if that was her car since she has a very common car and he said it looks like her. When it came to turn they were right next to us and I went to see if it was her driving and as did my husband and as we both looked, it appeared as if my mum was driving and my sister was in the front seat. But they were waving at us and just then we turned into our street and they went on by. It all happened really fast but I know what I saw and even my husband who was very skeptical has no explanation for this. Because I called my mum to see where she was going with my kids, jokingly of course, and she didn't answer. I was super confused because if she had been driving, she normally has her phone connected to the Bluetooth for music and to use the GPS as she's pretty unfamiliar with the city. I just brushed it off though and we parked and unloaded our groceries and my husband opens the door and in comes running my daughter with my mum following suit. I was super confused at first and quite shocked to be honest. My mum looked at me very concerned as to why I was staring at her like some foreign creature and then I proceeded to explain exactly what happened. She was meekly as shocked too and since I had my husband to back me up, we got pretty freaked out and went down this rabbit hole of other dimensions and whatnot. I know it all sounds crazy but honestly I just can't rationalise this any logical way. I just moved out of my childhood home and I wanted to share all the creepy stories that I saved up from there. For reference, I lived in the home from the time I was 10 to 11 to the time I was 18. So in the 80s, my grandparents, aunt and dad lived in the home for a minute. My papa was doing all repairs in the guest bedroom and as he tore down the wall, he found a few wooden toys stuck in the wall. Without thinking, he took out the toys and continued working and for a week, the house was just crazy. Things were flying off counters, they were hearing voices, seeing things. My nana yelled at my papa until he put the toys back in the wall and as soon as he did, it all just stopped. Additionally to that story, we had a computer room just inside the front door where, funnily enough, we put a futon for company to sleep. Every time I went into that room, I always felt bad. Like I wasn't allowed in the room and like I was being watched. It honestly just made my skin crawl and whenever I was home alone I'd shut the door before anyone left because I just couldn't handle the idea of being home alone with the room in view. Sometimes I'd go in to get something and it'd just smell like floral perfume as well. My mum's a hippie and only ever really wears oils and my sister never wore perfume so there was no way that it was either of them. Eventually since my nana is very close to me I told her about it and it just so happened to be the room where my papa found the toys. We think the people who lived there before us may have actually taken the toys out. Every single night I lived in the house it also sounded like someone was walking through the house with boots. I couldn't have friends over at night because they'd get scared and just want to leave. I remember up to the last night in fact that I spent in the house I always heard those footsteps. For the entire time I lived in the home, I lived in the basement which had a living room, two bedrooms and a bathroom. I lived in the father's bedroom right across from the bathroom. But when I was younger I had insomnia pretty bad so I'd stay up often and play on my phone or something to that effect. But one night I was laying in bed and heard soft scratching at my door which was odd. At first I thought it was my cat though so I called for her and 
called and called and nothing came. Eventually I went out to investigate and I searched the entire basement and I couldn't find either two of my cats and my dogs refused to go downstairs so it definitely wasn't them. Now, the only way to get into the basement is down the steps, and the steps are old, and they're woody, and they creak. But one of my cats is very fat, and she makes thumping noises going down the steps, too. And I didn't hear any of that, so I'm pretty sure it wasn't then. My other cat had long nails, and she would grab at the crappy carpet as she walked, which made soft padding sounds, too. And I didn't hear any of that, either. After realizing neither cat was downstairs and didn't make the scratching noise, I just ran back to my room and didn't leave until the morning. The next day I was home alone and I just got home from school and I was making a snack when I heard three soft knocks against the wall right in front of me. I froze and asked if anyone was there and it took a moment but there were three more knocks. I instantly remembered what the ghost investigator people said to do and called out politely Look, I'll share this house with you, but you can't scare me like this anymore. It's not okay. Please go away. And then it stopped. One night, I was standing in the middle of my room being goofy and just dancing to music. I stopped moving too because my music suddenly cut out and then I felt something tug at the bottom of my t-shirt. I was standing in the middle of the room where it was impossible for my shirt to get snagged on anything. Additionally, one night I was leaving my room and I went to grab the doorknob and before I could grab it, it just started shaking violently. I was scared half to death but I grabbed the doorknob and after a moment of it shaking, it just stopped. Growing up, my sister and I would wake up at the same time to get ready for school. She'd always go upstairs to get ready since there was an extra bathroom but she'd leave a room light on which was directly to the left of mine. I remember all throughout my middle school and high school years as I got ready for school that I'd always see these black figures out of the corner of my eye, mainly walking past the light of my sister's bedroom. And as I got older, I started seeing the figures more frequently in creepier positions. I remember one time I was in the kitchen talking to my mum and I saw a figure on all fours with its back hunched up sitting there just kind of facing us. But when I looked in the direction that it was, it was gone. In my stepdad and mum's room, there was a queen-sized bed that took up the majority of the room and across from the bed was a small cove, the closet and the door leading out to the hallway. And one night, my mum woke up from the dead of sleep to find a man in the cove just watching her. He had, in her words, old-timely church bibers, a button-up, sunken eyes and a lot of wrinkles. She told me that she didn't feel scared and that she didn't feel anything at all in fact. She just closed her eyes and eventually went back to sleep. We were talking one night while she was doing laundry. I was sitting on the basement stairs halfway up and she was in the laundry room to the right of me. We were chatting until all of a sudden she just exclaims, Hey, don't do that. And I laughed and asked what I did wrong and she shook her head and said that the old man spooked me and he was standing right behind me. Apparently, too, she sees him a lot but doesn't tell anyone because it just doesn't bother her. At the end of sophomore year of high school, my sister graduated in December and moved out. So naturally, I moved into her room thinking it was less haunted compared to my room. No way. My sister failed to tell anyone that she had seen a figure in her closet the entire time that she lived there and that is why she nailed her closet shut. So one night, it was late and I had all the lights off and was laying in bed talking on the phone with my girlfriend at the time. At the foot of my bed was a dresser facing me with one drawer slightly open because, well, I'm lazy. My girlfriend and I were talking about nothing in particular. I was staring in the darkness when, all of a sudden, something faintly green glows from the dresser drawer. At first, I thought something with batteries had just surged or something to that effect, so I turned on the lights to investigate and... All that was in the drawer was notebooks. Not a single thing that could glow in the pitch black like that. My girlfriend and I talked about it for a while and we just couldn't think of any rational explanation for what it was. So on another occasion, I had just got home from school. My stepdad was at work and so was my mum. I was tired so I went to take a nap. I'm slightly paranoid so I remember vividly locking the front and back door before going down for a nap. About an hour later, I woken up from my dogs growling. 
Now, my dogs are very sweet and pretty much never ever growl, and definitely not like this. So I panicked and grabbed my pocket knife and went upstairs to find them both on my parents' bed growling at the window. I looked outside and there was nothing there. Then, almost as if on cue, I hear footsteps behind me. My dogs ran to investigate and were barking like crazy and I followed after them and I searched the whole house with them and we didn't find anything. Nothing except the back door was unlocked and open. We never had a spare key so that was impossible and we have cameras and there was nothing on the cameras. I had my stepdad check and there wasn't anyone in the house and I just felt like I was going crazy at this point. Eventually, my mum came home early from work, though, to calm me down, and that was a pretty crazy moment. But one night, my mother and I were coming home from grocery shopping. My stepdad was at work, and it was just the two of us, so we were in a decent mood. But we were in the dining room, just off the kitchen, putting groceries away while joking that our house was hell. And my stepdad was a royal pain, and we were joking that he was the devil, when all of a sudden, a tin poster just flew off the wall. We lived a house down from the train tracks and the house shakes often and even that hadn't made the poster fall off but the one time that we talk about our home being hell it slams to the ground which was weird. Back in February my stepdad was in the garage which wasn't attached to the house but instead across the backyard. I had just gotten off work and he came inside complaining about his leg hurting. He said it burned like he walked through the thistle or something but it was in the negatives that week and he had layers and boots on so that was kind of impossible. My mum's a nurse so she took a look and there were three long scratches down the side of his calf. I was like no way and I asked to see his nails and he had bitten them down to the core so it definitely wasn't him. The dogs didn't leave a scratch mark like this and neither did the cats and again he was wearing layers so it just made no sense. He didn't believe me when I said it was a ghost. Personally, I thought whatever was in the home was getting him back for being such an ass, but that's neither here or there. I'm not sure if this connects too, but the downstairs had a sort of tunnel system in the wall that connected each and every cupboard in the basement. It was big enough at times for someone to crawl through, but you couldn't get into it because someone had blocked it off with wood. I actually found piles of empty baby jars in the tunnels, and I asked my mum what to do with them, and she said to just leave them there, so we don't stir anything up. Another small note too is that my mum actually saged the house once a month so that whatever was in there would quiet down. But it just never seemed to stop the whole time that I lived there. I'm currently a 29 year old guy living on the west coast and only recently have I taken an interest in anything paranormal again. I used to be very into the topic of ghosts when I was a kid. However, there was something that happened when I was 17 that scared me so badly that I steadfastly avoided anything paranormal for a long time. Until now, in fact. It's been 12 years since that day, and only now after over a decade of no ghost sightings at all do I feel like I can actually talk about it again. So when I was 17, I worked for a small business in a very small town of only a few thousand people in the Midwestern US. The business was on the town square, on the second floor of a two-story brick building that was constructed close to 100 years ago. The bottom floor was a furniture store or something, and the only way to gain access to the second floor was past a dead bolted glass door with a thick steel frame, and up a long straight flight of stairs. I taught self-defense classes part-time, which isn't a bad gig when you're just a teenager, the head instructor lived over an hour away, so it was up to me to teach one night a week and occasionally open the place up for the night before anyone arrived for class. Additionally, I was also required to clean the building at least once a week on our off days, which wasn't difficult as I usually only had to run the vacuum and clean the windows and the mirrors and whatnot. Opening the front door required turning the key in a very, very old deadbolt lock, which would occasionally stick and would only open with a very loud clicking sound. Now one day I stopped by work on an off day on the weekend with my girlfriend so we could clean the place. Just so no one saw my car parked outside and assumed that there was a self-defense class being held that night, I locked the door from the inside by turning the deadbolt and loudly clicking it into place before walking up the long flight of stairs. Working together we vacuumed the floors and made quick work of the place. 
because we were hormonally crazed teenagers that rarely had any quiet time alone. Of course, we took a moment to get busy on the floor of the front office while we were there too. Unprofessional, I know, but it's not like anyone was there. But the town square was deserted outside since it was the weekend and all the businesses were closed. And besides, I made sure the front door was locked and the only other person with a key to that particular lock was my boss who wasn't even in the same town at the time. Afterwards, I walked to the bathroom which was located in the back of the building and on my way to the front of the building while I was walking directly in the front of the stairs, I heard something. I heard a man's slow heavy footsteps coming up the long flight of stairs at the front of the building. I'll admit that my first instinct was just to turn and run since I was stark raving naked at the time and clearly wasn't expecting visitors. However, the second thought that I had was that this was completely impossible. I mean, I had locked the front door myself and it was an old deadbolt that barely worked, I admit. But besides, I would have heard a loud resounding click if someone had unlocked the door. So, against my better judgement, my burning curiosity had me taking a step forward. I had to see what was making the sound. I just had to. If nothing else, simply looking down the empty flight of stairs and seeing nothing would help me understand that I had merely imagined the noise, and that of course there was nothing there to make it. However, as I thought of all of this, the footsteps continued, and continued to get louder as I walked closer to the noise. And then... I saw it. It was a humanoid shadow. A solid, substantial shadow was climbing the stairs. This wasn't a shadow in the sense that somebody was blocking a light source or something and casting a flat shadow on a flat surface. It was more of a person. Imagine a shapeless or formless human cloaked in blackness. It had no hair, no facial features, no distinguishing characteristics of any kind, but was tall and broad-shouldered. Also, it was walking directly towards me. Its head appeared first, followed by its shoulders and then its torso. Then, it was as if it just looked up and was surprised to see me. I looked at it exactly where its eyes should have been, and it looked back for less than a fraction of a second before it jerked backwards as if startled and it just simply vanished, as if it had never even existed to begin with. I blinked several times and walked over to the top of the staircase and looked down the stairs, expecting to see someone somehow playing a trick on me or something, but when I did, there was nobody there. In fact, there was nothing there. And just as I had initially expected to see, before seeing the shadow that is, it was just a, an empty staircase, just as I thought it would be. I mean, after all, I had locked the front door myself, right? Immediately afterwards, I walked back to my girlfriend and we quickly got dressed and we just left. I didn't mention what I just saw to her, both because I didn't want to scare her and because I didn't think she would believe me anyway. I wrote off the entire incident as something that I just imagined, a bizarre hallucination of some sort. I mean, it couldn't have possibly happened, right? There was no one around outside the building since all the nearby businesses were closed. No one else had the key. And at first I thought that perhaps the shadow was just simply of someone passing by on the sidewalk downstairs. But the light from the front door only reached the bottom step of the stairs and it wouldn't explain how the shadow was somehow getting closer to me as well as somehow climbing the stairs. And well, I never saw the shadow again after that but it didn't quite end there because afterwards I felt as though someone was watching me every single time I walked into that building. I would have to unlock the place before each class and I would have to walk up the long stairway in the pitch darkness, mind you. The same staircase that I saw the shadow on. I occasionally heard footsteps after that and felt as if I was being followed as well. It was almost as if someone was just there and someone unseen who really, really didn't like me as well. It almost felt like I just wasn't welcome anymore and something wanted me to leave. Eventually, too, the feeling got so bad that I just didn't want to be alone in there anymore and I brought my girlfriend with me a second time and she later complained that she felt like someone was watching her. However, during the day, it just felt like a normal building. The oppressive, creepy feeling started around sunset and only got worse at night. Much, much worse. 
Around the time I graduated from high school, my boss decided the business was no longer profitable and chose to close the building down anyway. While it royally sucked to lose my only paying job, I was very glad to never have to set foot in that place ever again. About a year later, I was in a new relationship and I told my new girlfriend the story of all that I saw in my old job. She was curious, so one night I drove by and parked the car directly in front of the door. It had been quite some time since I was last there, so surely it was safe by now, right? But when I got close, I immediately felt like I was being watched. Whatever it was, it definitely had never left. It was like someone was just standing at the top of the stairs and was glaring downwards with such unbelievable hatred and malice that it was unbearable. My girlfriend immediately noticed it as well and she really freaked out and demanded that I slam my foot on the gas pedal to get us out of there immediately. And of course, I did. Even to this day, over a decade later, I still don't feel comfortable driving past that building after dark when I fly home to visit my parents. I don't know what I saw there, but it's clearly rooted to that building, whatever it is, and either cannot or will not leave. Do any of you have any ideas about what it could have been? Maybe understanding it a little more will help me feel like I didn't lose my mind when I was a teenager. Anyway, thanks for listening.